three, two, one. I got a little hectic out there. I, I'd like to try to see if I can get the dragon to regurgitate the people in the cockpit to sort of squeeze them a little bit. I am going to throw my gun at them. Yeah, war, war really changes a person, huh? <laughs> Hey everybody, it is Thursday, February 22nd. My name is Bobby Frankenberger and you're listening to episode 37 of the Sixth World Podcast. Today's executive producer, forever the executive producer of our show, despite the fact that we don't even have a Patreon running anymore and this is the last episode. He was the executive producer for so long. He's the executive producer of our hearts. James O'Neill, thank you for um, how much support you gave to the show over all the time we've been doing it. But other than James, I'm always joined by my co-host, Cassie Levitt. How's it going, Cassie? What's up, Bobby? Good I'm, to see you here. Yeah, it's good to see you, too. It's it's uh, it's great to see you. I'd go so far as to say that. I would, I would venture so far as to say it's great to see you. Um, <laughs> venture those dangerous lands. But our guest for our final episode, which is Poetic in its symmetry and mathematics uh, is Opti, our first guest and our last guest. Opti, the uh, everyone's favorite crow shaman, although lately I hear raven shaman. What's, what's the difference? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Mm -hmm. So crow and raven, I mean, they're, they're the same. I guess technically they're, they're different, but. I, I think um, they technically are different birds. <laughs> yeah. They're not. Well, like same, same family, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm not an yeah, the, ornithologist. Yeah, Is that world, what they're called? The ancient world didn't have didn't have more than one word for them. So they were the same bird in the ancient world. <laughs> if you say so, I am I not do. a I'm not a birder, so I don't know these things. That's that's a thing, right? Birding. Sure. I don't, know. I don't think that's yeah. It's where you chase down birds, not like literally Falconer. chase them down. You uh you sneak up on them and take their picture. It's kind of like the uh the creepy pervy uh voyeur of the of the animal world. <laughs> so uh, yeah, bird watching. They 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 call themselves birders. Do but, they really? Yeah, I'm not making that up. When I was saying that's a thing, right? That was just a rhetorical kind of thing. I know I know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you say so. I, ju I just I I'm not really dumb. I just play one on TV. Um, oh, good. <laughs> well, guess what, guys? It's our last show. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> yeah, we don't either, so it's okay. This is a safe. This is a safe place. Um, there's no judgment. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna do it up right on this last episode. Everybody who's watching in the chat, stick around for the end because we're gonna hang out for a while at the end and and reminisce. And you can still ask us questions and do whatever we're gonna do. In fact, in just a minute, I have something that I thought was fun to put together. Uh, is uh, a little mashup of all the, it's it's a mashup of all the cold opens we've done. I've done uh, over all of our 37 episodes. So um, that'll be fun. It's like four uh -huh. minutes long. We'll sit back and enjoy it. I thought it would be fun. Um, speaking of episode 37, you know how much I like numbers, right, Cassie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw this. This is a dad joke <laughs> thing. Continue. It's not a dad. It's not a joke at all. It's it's kind of. It's, it's episode 37. Is this there's there's something special about every number is what I uh, is what I really like about numbers and and uh, and num I'm a number file so to speak. Um, number thirty seven is the twelfth prime nu prime number. It's also one of the uh, per permutable primes, which means it's a prime number that can be permutated to be another prime number, which is seventy three. One of the cool things, so thirty seven and seventy three are both prime numbers. One of the cool things about that, even further, is that thirty seven is the twelfth prime number. If you if you switch it around, seventy three is the twenty first prime number, which switched around is twelve. It's it's like an Ouroboros. It's like a snake eating itself. <laughs> Uh, I, you don't look amused. How about um, it's a <laughs> it's a, it's a star number. Do you know what a star number is? No, nope. it's a star number. <laughs> a star number is a prime, Tell us, Bobby. is a prime number. Is it the one on the keyboard? And, okay. Never yeah, mind. it's the one underneath. No, that's the number eight. The asterisk <laughs> number. Um, <laughs> shift eight. Uh, but no, a star number is a prime number that you can arrange if you take a number of dots equal to 
the the number itself so 37 dots you can arrange it in uh in this certain star formation like um like chinese checkers so 100 and what is that 121 is a prime and that's not it it's somewhere around there is a prime number and, and that's how many spots are on a chinese checkers board um so can you tell i like numbers uh normal yeah. normal human no. body temperature is 37 degrees celsius that's uh, 37 uh, atomic number of rubidium and the number of plays thought to have been written by Shakespeare and also I didn't know this did you know that the channel 37 is banned like you can't use the channel 37 as for television well I did not know that apparently it's a UHF broadcast channel that's reserved for radio astronomy in North America and South America what's radio astronomy Oh, well, we won't go down that rabbit hole. Basically, it's just uh, radio astronomy uses radio telescopes. It's radio using radio telescopes, um, just radio waves to detect far off objects. So if anything ever comes in on channel 37, that's aliens. Probably, probably. All right. Or All right. supernovae, novae, that exploded because of aliens. Uh, Valetta Vadim <laughs> chat says, any joke make that Bobby makes is by definition a dad joke. That's true. I am a dad. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what have you guys been doing this past week or two weeks or, or Opti since the last time you were on the show? What have you guys been doing? That's been a long time. <laughs> oh. Uh, I've been working on Shadowrun writing. Yeah, like um, you do. I, I... I have one thing that I need to finish up, and once I'm done with that, then uh, my plan is to do more podcasting and pick my get my crap back together. <laughs> is that so? Do, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've been waiting so. for it. Okay, we've been waiting for you to get your crap back together. <laughs> you have no idea. You and everyone else in my life. Um, and uh, and uh, I actually I did um, I. I, a couple months ago, I tested for my recommended black belt, first degree black belt in Ooh. Hapkido, and uh, there's 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 a uh, two levels. There's the um, recommended level, and then there's the certified level. So the recommended is like they all think you got it in you, you know, you you're a good boy, and then like you have to do a bunch of work and like you know show your work and like write a bunch of papers and stuff like that, and then go test again, and they'll be like, yeah, you actually are this time. You have to write. Oh, I, you have to write essays and papers to get a black belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? So, uh, I thought you just have to kick people's asses. Yeah, that's <laughs> not it's it. More than that, it's a philosophy. Right. On. Yeah. So, so yeah, I had. To, I spent a lot of a lot of time um, over the last month writing a bunch of. Should I tease what I'm writing about? Um, writing a bunch for the upcoming uh, Matrix book for Shadowrun. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, which should make a lot of people happy, but I, I don't know how much I can say about it. Yeah, the book that everyone's going to complain there wasn't enough Technomancer stuff in. That's my prediction. Oh, I really doubt they're going to say that about this book. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> well, Interesting. I, I probably said too much. <laughs> uh, we love to corner Opti when he comes onto the show. Um. <laughs> Bob likes to talk and get himself into trouble. He likes to surf the crest of the NDA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never know how far you can go until you cross the line. That's what I say. Right, right, right. Yeah, but and that's when you end up fired. That's not, <laughs> right. you don't cross that line. I mean, I mean really, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, well, I'm, maybe I'm making more of it, but I don't think they would fire me for that. I, I would, I would I hope not. We're all looking forward to when, um, whatchamacallit comes out, uh, uh, better than bad. We've been looking forward to that forever. So. Me too. Me too. I, you know, one of the things that I, I really, I mean, dislike is probably not the right word, but it is frustrating. Like when you turn in something like a long time ago, and then you just wait and wait and wait and wait, and like it's like, when is this gonna come out? I wrote about this like a year ago, so it's kind of fun. That's what happened. To, you, that's what would happen to me. And it comes out, and you're like, did I write that? <laughs> that's what would happen to me after finals every semester in college and that was only like three weeks waiting for my final grade I can't imagine mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, that was my poor attempt at empathy um, just so you know 
Uh, hey, how about uh, how about we play something real quick? I have uh, a fun little thing that I put together, and it's a little kind of mashup of all, you know how every episode I do these little short little cold open blurbs right before the thing. Well, I thought let's um, I thought I'd go through and um and and mash them up all together into one long thing and listen to them. I wanted to do like a like a funny mashup reel, but I don't keep track of any of the funny things we say and I don't listen to our show after after I post it or after I make it. So go I don't ahead, go ahead and do that and then I'm gonna talk about what I've been up to the last two weeks. Yeah, well I'm trying to I'm trying to break <laughs> things up a little bit. Why don't you talk about it before I do? No. No no, no. do your mashup. Do your mashup. You, well you gotta excited. make me feel like real bad yourself. here. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. I was just trying to keep things flowing. Okay, I'll, I pro we'll we'll talk about it in a second. Here we go. And uh, yes, here we go. All right. Well, it's time. It's time for things. So here we go. Three, two. Use a plot point. Leave Security guards come out. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna add a plot point to this roll. Add a glitch die. One of my plot points. Okay, plot point. I'm gonna spend a plot point. 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 On question number one, how much you need to start up a KFC? If only I was a teen boy once, I'd have a better experience. I apologize, sir. Liquid crystal displays. I want the club sandwich. I want the cold Mexican beer. I want a ten thousand dollar a night hooker. Two big nasty men. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. There are clearly a number of ways in which a Christmas carol could be introduced. You are witnessing the ultimate miniaturization of the cassette player. The creation of microcircuitry, the smallest motor of its kind. The reinvention of the wheel, the chassis, the case. You are witnessing the birth of the Super Walkman from Sony. Ever heard of a lie? Hey, have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and beaten until you pissed blood? Oh. There's no substance or purpose to them whatsoever. You should just order French fries. Joy listening to the Sets Wolf Podcast. This is Hans Gruber. I assume you realize the futility of direct action against me. We have no wish for further loss of life. Hans, Bobby. We got parents and stuff. You got parents and stuff? I need a computer. The weird thing that's happening here is that McDonald's is literally putting a dollar value on human affection. Totally. This is the beginning of the end. I'm warning you, everybody. Big Macs for hand jobs. We're getting a higher than normal radiation count since that quake. The meters say it's coming from outside Sea Lab. What's the Miller Roentgen count? It just passed 0 .08 per hour. The security aspect of cyber is very, very tough. Blimey, Harry, didn't you ever wonder where your mom and dad learned it all? Mom, mom. You're a wizard, Harry. Bali Mangati Kali Ma. Mukti Degi Kali Ma. Kali Ma. Kali Ma. An innovative world of electronics. Climbed up in the dragon's mouth. This program is a continuation of my series on the Denver International Airport, and especially the murals and the art contained therein. Because they are evil, they are signs of Satanism, and on this program I will point out that many of them are phallic symbols. A bullet came through the window and struck your Johnson. Carl! 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 Uh, what is promising to be a fairly moderate length we're going to be going up, uh, up and down the serpent. Visitors from outer space! We come in peace to bring you terrific tasting space dust sizzling candy. Space dust? Will you experience the sizzle of galactic grape, orbiting orange, and cosmic cherry flavors? Wow, the cherry tastes delicious! I'm sizzling grape! The great smith turns into a dragon and eats you! What? Right, huh? Hey, but if there's any girls there, I want to do them! Dungeons and Dragons, Satan's Game. 
I'm attacking the darkness. Gulstaff casts a friendship spell on both of you. Your wolf for mitzvah, spooky, scary. Boys becoming men, men becoming wolves. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. Double crossed another time. An available Delco Bose stereo with four never before speakers. Separately engineered for sound that's out of this world. Never before. Welcome, students. Today I will tell you the difference between an entrepreneur and a businessman. Let's know about this in detail. Are you a businessman or an entrepreneur? Have you ever wondered what the difference between the two is? Punk ass bitch. Ah! <laughs> you were right there at the end, sir. Nice. All right. I'm uh so that uh so I think I fixed it um but while we were doing all that there was some weird on the stream so um I've I've lowered the bit rate and everything so it usually doesn't affect audio but uh streamy people on there um hopefully it won't make things ugly uh but yeah that was it um that was fun those are all the things that we've played at the beginning of every episode before I I uh, started the show Cassie what have you been doing I since the last episode I just wanted to plug I'm writing a Shadowrun goon sheet that's mm. all I had for roll 20. I don't know what that is. So when you sounds... say a goon... Uh, so, so you think whenever you run do missions or something like that, you know the little black and white text box that you uh, have in a missions game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, this, the, uh, like the brief stat I've... block. Yeah, I'm just putting that into Shadowrun and then going to put buttons on it so it's, you can just click them and roll things in Roll20. That's amazing. Yeah. I can't wait for you to finish that because we could really use that on the Shadowrun Missions Online stuff that we are in the middle of testing because we don't let our players uh, use character sheets. Yeah, there's not, there's not a good Shadowrun character sheet on Roll20 currently. There's some all right ones, but... This one will be just for GMs. Players could use it. It's going to have modifiers and stuff, so you could put your base stuff in there and then add more. But, uh, yeah, so I'll get that done. That should make it a little bit easier, especially I want to code in, because I already have the macros and everything to code in, like, immunity to normal weapons that a spirit has. That way you can just hit the button and it will roll it for you, and you don't have to worry about, like, doing all the math in your head and stuff. So right. just automate a lot of your rolls. Right. That awesome. would be amazing. That's probably my least favorite calculation to do uh, ever. Sir, you have not used demolitions in Shadowrun. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about <laughs> long division? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Or I'm chunks gonna... of salsa. Do you like Not geometry? <laughs> I I don't think I've ever had a player use demolitions in a in a game. We've <laughs> properly used demolitions like straight up from the back road faster, and it took two of us in a night and a map of us like mm. trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> and a calculus textbook and. Yeah, That's we were the point I would have just said. A, yeah, a it all blows up. Moving on. Yeah, we do it from a GM NPC side, right? So we were setting up a plot element, so we had the time right. to do it versus on a run in the middle of a. <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So I'm working on that, and I'm gonna probably post it to our Shadow Run and get everybody who's interested in it, because I know a lot of GMs or or players don't use character sheets at Roll Twenty, uh, and so this will this will let people use that option. That's awesome. That's really great. I like yeah. that. I, I like I said. I think it'll be especially useful for people who do things more one shot style with different people all the time. So yeah, and a lot of us love to use Hero Lab as players and stuff because it does all our roles and whatnot. But this yeah, would be exactly. nice for GM to put in their stat blocks because especially I call it the goon sheet because a lot of times the goon NPCs don't have really dynamic stuff that you have to worry about too much. It's it's usually somewhat more simplified. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Let's I'll do this. World news today. How, how when are you planning on getting that finished? By the way, do you know? <laughs> Hopefully, I'll have it done by next month. Next or it next month. I will have it done at the end of the next month. And you're gonna put it on yeah. Reddit, the Shatter and subreddit. Yeah, it's already in GitHub, and I'll post it on Reddit and tell people how to use it. Awesome. So news is uh, Gen Con tickets. We they've been on. We've uh, lots of stuff has already happened with Gen Con, but the only thing that I have to say about that is that we just got a notification in the email. I say we, I mean like. If you 
have ever gone to Gen Con and have an account with Gen Con, you got this email. It may have gone to your spam folder. But anyway, uh, they're saying that they're on pace to sell out again this year. So um, that uh, you might want to make sure that you, you get your tickets sooner than later. It's not like they're about to sell out or anything, but they said that is it's looking like they're on pace to sell out. So um, don't wait until the last minute is what I'm saying because I'm going to be there. Opti's going to be there. Cassie will begrudgingly be there. And um, <laughs> and uh, I know we're going to have a Shadowcasters Network panel there. And Cassie is... Uh, I don't want to obligate her to something that she... Uh, but she says she's going to have a lore panel that she I'm, wants to put together. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I was filling it out before we started the show. I'm just getting Opti and Rusty and see if I can get Kevin to lock in a time. We're going to do it. We're going to do I feel, it. I feel like... This little, my my phone is right here to the left of me, and it's like ding 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 ding, and I'm like, who is this? Oh, it's Rusty and Kevin and Cassie talking about a lore panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because while you, while you were while you Happening went out in on real time <laughs> while you went out on Skype, I was like, hey Cassie, did you ever put that together? She was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it right now. <laughs> but, but it looks promising from the text messages that we have going. So yeah, so um, yeah, so you should go there. It's going to be cool. Um, Cassie had a great idea, and so she's going to put that together. We wanted to do it last year, um, but it was too late by the time we thought of it. And then Cassie said, "No, I'm going to do it this year." So awesome. <laughs> um, the other thing, I, we actually got a response email, and we never do response emails. So I figured, you know, why, what better time to start doing response emails than on the last show uh, from Joel or Gripper. Uh, he said, just listen to the Sixth World Podcast Neonet in Memoriam episode. That was the last one we did. The episode itself is a perfect example of why I love Shadowrun more than, a more than just a game. It's a community invested in this detailed and evolving, evolving world. I agree. We have a really passionate community that loves the world. That's what... Uh... Anyway, he says, to add to what was being talked about, one thing to add to the Neonet fail is that Loafweir uh, abdicated the role of lore master... Uh, he ab we were talking about the lore master, who was lore master of the dragons, and he said Lofweir actually abdicated the lore of the role of lore master after the great Draconic Civil War, um, in order to fo focus more on Seder Krupp, and the role went to Keladir, and the, mm. and the you know he says the same Keladir who lost his, who lost his triple A corp, and then he speculates might this be part of Lofweir's plan. Who knows with these lizards? But it's worth bringing up. I agree. Um, yeah. Because we we mentioned that uh, you, I think uh, Cassie and and Brooke reminded me that Keladir was lore master, not Lofweir anymore. And so uh, uh, Gripper Joel is saying, hey, that was actually Lofweir uh, gave it up voluntarily after all that happened. And so. Yeah, you gotta think like, like does Lofweir actually think that you know? Focusing on his company is that much bigger of a deal than being the lore master of the dragons and that's what I think he's been a dragon oh. He's been he's been a dragon much much longer than uh, or he's been in that community much much longer than he's been in the Seder crook community You know? Yeah. Yeah. I Don't know good theory good theory yeah. All right, so uh, No, that's it for news then we'll do this Uh, Q&A. We always do Q&A every episode, and the, this episode's no different. So, um, you can't, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to skip all the where you can send it, because we're not, <laughs> this is the last episode, you can't send us questions. I'll you can tell you where you can send it. You can send you it. You can always post questions to twitter.com slash emeraldgrid. I'll answer them going forward, because mm. I'm, don't you mm, have, I know answers. Cassie, don't you have some kind of lore subreddit? Is that still a thing? Yeah, there's still people posting ever there, but those aren't always mechanical questions. We typically true, get more true. mechanical questions. We get a lot of mechan mechanical questions here. So yeah, Cassie says, send me, them to Emerald Grid. Find the Emerald Grid Twitter, and you reply to me. I, I can't say I'll... I don't check it frequently, but as soon as I check it, I'll answer questions. And you can send them to my Twitter account, uh, twitter.com, or, you know, GM Funky Town, and when I get it, I'll think, man, that's a really good question, and then I'll start researching it, and then my kids will need a diaper change or start screaming and then i'll and forget then he'll, and then he'll post it on the emerald grid twitter account. yeah and then i'll, I'll forward it to cassie and say will you answer this for me <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to skip the middleman <laughs> if you have silly questions that you want me to answer in character you can 
give me a dear Opti question at Opti at neo-anarchist.com. Yeah, Opti, Opti claims he's going to start his podcast uh, up on the regular again where he, where he will. Mm-hmm. Now that we're going, <laughs> he's going to fill in the, the, the gaps that we're leaving. Um, anyway, yeah. we do have questions. First one is from Derek Workman. I like that name, Workman. He's a working man. It's spelled workman. Um, anyway. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's a nice wage slave name. Yeah. Derek Workman. Here, uh, he says, uh, how does the ritual to become a... Somebody pronounce that for me. Comedi? Comedi. Comedi? Okay. How does the ritual to become a Comedi in the Court of Shadows affect the Awakened? Can a Comedi be awakened? The book isn't clear. In Shadowrun, Con- in Shadowrun canon through the years, there's been an effort to keep magic... M- magical and the matrix technological oh to keep magic magical and the matrix technological here technomancers cannot also or hence technomancers i'm doing a bad job reading guys i apologize all Derek right, workman the, <laughs> right, the question is for anyone who doesn't know because you need to understand what one of these things is essentially there's a magic ritual that happens that screws with someone's mind and memory that basically turns a person into a technomancer where they can be data storage Oh. And he's asking about uh, what happens if you're awakened then. Uh, in that context, it doesn't say in the book because this process, and it doesn't really need to, because this process is basically going to make your character an NPC. You're not playing that character probably anymore because you've basically become a data dump. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, like a, but, you become a human USB stick? Yeah, you basically become a human USB storage, but that's okay. Uh, the point thing is, is we've... Definitely in the 5th edition, they've already set that standard. So what happens when a Technomancer becomes a, uh, has gets, gains a magic attribute is they just lose all their residence abilities, their residence skills become knowledge skills instead of active skills, and they no longer have access to the Matrix. And I would imagine the same thing would happen in this case. Like, essentially, you would lose your magical attribute, your magic skills would become knowledge skills, and you'd no longer have access to the magic that's not laid out for say in the book is exactly what happens. I'm merely just using the the references for what happens when PCs become oh, like uh, infected with HMHVV, and so you gain a magic attribute and you lose all your resident stuff. Right, you're um, you're extending that logic to this. Yeah. So, but I don't know, maybe not. There's definitely uh, it's definitely crossing a line a little bit because it seems like it's a magical ritual that makes someone's brain basically a text answer that can, can be hacked for the data that's inside of it. Yeah. What, what's up? You got for this? Sure. Sure? <laughs> yeah. Opti doesn't care. I, you know, I, I, I do, I care, but, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, there is no answer yet. And so yeah. anything we kind of throw out there will be like, until until it gets put down on paper somewhere in a book somewhere, like, I don't know, tell yeah. a good story with it, you know? <laughs> right, right. There's no answer, but there's sort of the precedence going the other right. way. Technomancers become right. magical. So if you're trying to do it to a PC or something or curious, use it that way. As far as the bridging of Matrix and magic, like, I think that's been broken for a long time. Like, that's that's been melding together for a very long time. Yeah, and, and like that's that's I guess where I was going with like you know the the there you can't in fifth edition you can't be a technomancer and a mage, but nobody really knows why, and like that's gotta that's gotta eventually be addressed, but yeah. it hasn't been yet. Like there's no yeah. reason we don't know why we don't know why does how, it have because... to be addressed? Because I feel like when you address those questions, you start to like make those ideas concrete, and then everybody. And then you give yourself ways for everybody to get pissed off at you later. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I guess when I said it has to be addressed, I just meant probably should be though. Well, I, mean, just... I guess I guess what I meant by that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never mind. It doesn't matter what I meant by that because the, <laughs> because the Shadowrun writing team has the, has the answer in hand. I see. And... I see. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those things that when people, when it's finally answered, be like, oh, we were, you know, that that was coming at some point. Because it is. Like, there are you definitely... Can't just, you can't just string a mystery out forever. Like Yeah. There's you know. definitely cases in 5th edition of technomancers becoming magical, and this is a perfect case of magic turning people into technomancers. So that line is... <laughs> that line is already blurring together. Yeah. Right, right. Well, uh, there you go, Derek Workman. Our next question is from Ross D'Souza. Uh, this one's a little bit lighter. Says, um, when I say lighter, I mean less, less like 
mechanical or less less concrete. If you had to have a single piece of wear, cyberware or bioware, what would you have? I'd pro he said he says he'd probably go for cyber eyes. Um, what would you what would you go for? Opti. I mean, I, oh good, yeah. You too Sorry, I keep there. cutting you off. This whole episode no, is about like, no, oh, is Cassie I'm, I'm is Cassie here. on this I'm gonna, podcast too? I'm gonna check my emails. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear what Cassie has to say first. Yeah. This was a tough one because my I'm a vain creature, so my first mm. thought was silky skin, right? I just wanted to be smooth all the time. <laughs> but I I really hate sleeping, so sleep regulator. Okay, that's I a really good one. Does uh, lionization count? That's uh, technically geneware, but oh yeah, yeah, that's not cyber or bioware. Good, uh, good well, catch, Cassie. Data jack. Yeah, that's See, kind I, of. I considered the data jack, but there's nothing to plug it into yet. So we'd have to do that the technology has gotten up there, right? I, I think they'll let me live longer is what I'm getting at. So maybe like a cyber uh. liver. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, wait, what, what is that, what's that thing that they uh, that they totally ripped off from um, uh, from Cybermancer or Neuromancer that was um, like that thing that filters out all the toxins in your body? So like, you know, you can't, you can't get poisoned, but like yeah. you can't you can't get drunk either. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, is it, that is like the toxin extractor, right? Something like that? Something like that. Like the nephritic like screen? Somewhere. Is that something? Just filters out stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe just get some nanites, you know, just keep the... CFD? Just some repairs. random nanites. Yeah. Eh. <laughs> I feel like I could stand to have a, a real interesting random uh, passenger in my brain. That'd be cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I could power down for three three hours a night and be good... I mean, that sounds great. I want three hours every, three hours every forty eight hours, whatever it is. That sounds awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like, I like sleeping either. But but um, I think hydraulic jacks in my legs would be awesome. Go go gadget, you know, legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like the the bone lacing. Like I don't know. Like all my all my shit's falling apart right now. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> like but just but just in really small ways. So I don't know exactly what's gonna like go big. You know, bad. Uh. You know. Tailored pheromones can get you pretty far, so <laughs> that'd be pretty yeah, But sometimes not in directions you want to go. So right, like, I, feel like, I feel like tailored pheromones kind of borders on the manipulative, and that oh, also as a to me. also as a married person, I guess I could get myself into trouble that way. Yeah. So and you're uh, gonna get parking tickets, but you're gonna have other problems. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wow. I don't know why, but I'm feeling awfully attracted to the, <laughs> the ticket. Thank you, sir. You're going to go through that probably like, oh, you just can't turn people down anymore. You're like, God damn, I don't want to go to dinner with you. I'm done. I just <laughs> want to pay my parking ticket. Yeah, just here, take my money. <laughs> constantly being hit on. You might get tired of it after a while. Yeah, that's, that's I don't, fair. I don't think pheromones really work that way, though, right? I mean, they just, like, they're subtle. They're more subtle. Yeah. Probably. But Probably. Like they're not. They're not. I feel like if I douse myself in pheromones, it's not going to really do anything. <laughs> it's going to be like, wow, Alfie doesn't smell quite as bad today. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that has a lot more to do with the fact that pheromones or are maybe really it does, a human and thing. Like, but... I, you know, I don't know why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know what it is about you. <laughs> um, it's extra sticky today, but. I like it. <laughs> that's a uh, that's a good point. Here, here, let's do this. All right, it's time to go on. That's right, Opti. Soak it in. Um, that's uh, we're gonna do our main topic today. We've uh, we're here to the final main topic of our final episode. Only main topic. Spinrad is what we're talking about today. Johnny Spinrad, but more, more generally, I mean, yeah, the like like the conceit, uh, the reason to get together is Johnny Spinrad. But we're really, really we're gonna end up talking about. Um, Spinrad Industries, his corporation. We're going to be talking. We're going to end up talking about Global Sandstorm, um, naturally, and and kind of kind of where corporate stuff may be going from here, because a lot of signs point to it. Uh, a lot more activity happening in the Middle East and Africa, which is where this uh, company is, at least Global Sandstorm, and by virtue of that, uh, Spinrad as well, where they're headed. Um, but. Why are we even talking about Spinrad, Opti? Why do we, we care? We are talking about Spinrad, uh, Johnny and his company, Spinrad Industries, and the newest 
triple a corporation spin rad global because there is a new triple a corporation called spin rad global <laughs> right mm-hmm. right they have uh taken the place that uh neonet had so that's that's why we're talking about it yeah and let- you may not there's i bet there's people listening to this that didn't know that i bet you that's true and you know one of the reasons is we get this question a lot and i want to make it clear right now to anybody who's listening because because i've seen people ask this and be confused about it before let's make it clear that yes spinrad industries is replacing neonet as the as the as a triple a corporation um the reason they're correct what <laughs> way to make yeah. make my clarification spinrad, even more confusing spinrad global spin spinrad replacing, global you're right you're right i'm sorry spinrad, spinrad industries, industries is a part of spin global part of spinrad. yes okay yes, okay yes. now yes. you have it so it's spin- important don't forget global sandstorm in this equation yeah so yeah. so spinrad global which is a which is spinrad industries and and global it's, sandstorm it's essentially together. A, the, the the merger uh of yeah. spinrad industries and global sandstorm yeah, and there's there's other companies, there's other double A uh, and A companies in that as well, but the the two main um, factions, I guess, would probably be the best way to say it. Yeah. Within that company are Global Sandstorm and Spinrad Industries. And to clear things up, so so yes, yeah, Spin Global is the ne- is the AAA replacing Neonet. The reason that's been confusing, I've been told by multiple people, is just because that was supposed to uh, two books were published out of order. Uh, because one of them was delayed. Is that the reason why it seems to be a little confusing? Uh, yes. There is um, a book that is meant to come out soon called uh, Street Lethal. Yeah. And it deals with um, it, it, a little bit more in depth, uh, you know, how that hell happens and, and right. why and blah, blah, blah. But essentially, the 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 trigger is pulled as of mm, dark terrors i believe yeah is the first is the first official like this is this is it guys it happened so right right it's, it's... you you get you get spinrad's uh global sandstorm and spinrad's trajectory in a bunch of different books uh leading up to dark terrors but dark terrors was technically supposed to come afterwards right. um so i think street lethal will still have um a, a, an in character date of before dark terrors um, so yeah, right. So that's why we're talking about Spinrad and his uh, Megacorp is because he's a big deal now. This whole thing is a big deal now, um, and yeah. that's and that's what we want to talk about. Um, Global Sandstorm and and it, even if it was only Global Sandstorm and Spinrad Industries, which it was not, but even if it was only those two, the merger of those two would put it. Uh, in terms of uh, terms of power and assets, would put it ahead of actually some of the the AAA megacorps, even without uh, becoming a AAA themselves. Right, I was reading that, assets. and in both the write ups about uh, Spinrad Industries and Global Sandstorm, like you you were saying, in those write ups, it said each individually had were worth more than some of the current AAAs. That's that was really interesting to me. Yeah. So the merger of the two puts them. And then becoming the AAA puts them actually um, quite far ahead of some of the other AAAs. They are actually one of the most powerful corporations on the planet now. Right. Like, I would say top five. Um, yeah, I was going to say, what were they falling the ranking? I'm a I'm really big fan of trying to get Wu Xing to become number five <laughs> because of that cool symbolism uh, of having, like, the quints and the five Wu Xing elements. Oh, right, right. Um, <laughs> So I don't care. They could be four or six. <laughs> <laughs> you just want them right there in the they middle. Can't, they can't be number five. Right. So Cassie, obviously, if some of the if if these two guys individually uh, were worth more than some of the triple A's, obviously, um, it's not net worth that makes you a triple A. What makes you a triple A, right. Cassie? Remind people. Power. Uh, whether it's net worth or your influence or I mean that could be a variety of different things right it's a much more abstract concept Uh, so it's all of your assets money and all that stuff but it's also about what you can achieve and what kind of you can pull I guess concretely um, it's like definition wise um, it's it's being a member of the corporate court right well that that'll be yeah I mean get up there you'll be a member of the corporate court but all of the the AAs, AAAs, AAAs are triple A's or member of the corporate court, right? That's so. what I mean, though. Does does yeah, is it the other way around? Does becoming court. a triple A make you a member of the corporate court, or does becoming a member of the corporate court make you a triple A? 
Is it chicken or egg? It's kind of both and. Um, because the corporate court decides who becomes a triple A. Oh, okay, okay. So it's <laughs> knowing that knowing that whoever becomes a triple A is going to get a seat on the corporate court. Right. You know what I mean? So it's a, you know. So uh, but there's only three corporations that that have seats on the corporate court without without kind of being grandfathered in. Like being grandfathered in via, you know, one of the seven original um, members of the corporate court. Um, and so the original companies that founded it, there were seven of them. They each have what's called a golden ticket. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of the, the way to say that. Let's talk and about this from the other, because I think it might be interesting to talk about this from the other direction. Which, what three are the ones who are not guaranteed to be in there? Who are in there because they were the corporate court decided you guys are worthy of being part of our group? Which, what three are those? If I'm not mistaken, it's Wuxing, Horizon. And that's where I got. I'm Wu Sing Horizon. Who's the next one? Sing Horizon and maybe no Who's Evo it? has one. Um, mm, is it that's S? a great question. Is it S Technologies? I don't know. I now I, I, you've you've caught me. I don't know <laughs> the answer to that question. As Technology, uh, I believe, has has a ticket. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So, <laughs> but you came into this so confident. I know, and now you've you've stumbled me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, gotcha. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Is it Evo? No, it's no, because Evo has uh, uh, has the old Yamatetsu. Here's one. we're gonna figure this out. Go, I'm on I'm on the internet. Nobody's you, gonna know. You Somebody's guys keep know. keep talking about it. Yeah, chat. You guys should know. Wuxing, Horizon, and Evo is what Crimson dude. Yeah, it's, it's Evo. That what it it's, okay, Evo. Yeah, thought, it, it, right, right. They were formed by Yamatetsu, but that was not one of the original. Or maybe founders. Yamatetsu didn't have original one. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. there you go. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, um, so the reason I, I wanted to come at it from that way is because, keep in mind, so so Spin Global is replacing Neonet. Neonet is not one of those three that was moved. So it's not like Neonet... Uh, ne they're replacing Neonet by some other means, and what would that be? Right. It wasn't that the corporate court decided that SpinRad Global was going to get uh, the AAA seat. Uh, it was that um, uh, Richard Villiers and Johnny SpinRad, as soon as Richard Villiers, well, we should back up. When Neonet started you know, encountering their problems in Boston, the corporate court came down on them pretty hard uh, and began to strip them of, not strip them of assets, but basically force them to pay a bunch of uh, reparations costs, which is going to not bankrupt them, but put them in a pretty bad position. Right. So uh, Richard Villiers decided like, you know what, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get out while it gets good, <laughs> right. and started selling a bunch of his assets. And the corporate court said basically like, listen, you're not gonna be able to, you know, uh, pull these shenanigans, you know, again, because you destabilized the corporate court, you know, and kind of drug our name through the mud. And so you can't be on the corporate court. Uh, no, no corporation that you control is going to be on the corporate court for I think it was ten years. Um, and so he goes, okay, walked out of that meeting into a closed door meeting with Johnny Spinrad, and then they walked out, and basically Johnny Spinrad is uh, leasing <laughs> that company from him. Uh, and so right. Johnny Spinrad and his Spinrad Global have control of JRJ uh, International, which is one of the original seven members of the corporate court. So as Johnny Spinrad con controls that original company, he actually has a grandfathered seat on the corporate court. Right. Which is basically everything he's ever wanted his whole life is to be uh, a mega corporation, one of the big, you know, the triple A's. So he's yeah. finally got it. Dream come he's got, true. He's got 10 years to figure out how to make it more permanent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because Villiers is not, is, is a crafty fellow. Um, yeah. So uh, he's going to be in the in the background uh, dealing with that over the next ten years. But before we get too much into, because we're going to talk about Spinrad more, um, it, this is an episode about Spinrad. But uh, I think I think it might be worth taking a, a brief aside and talking about the other big half of Spin Global, which is Global Sandstorm. Um, yeah. Who are they? Uh, they've they've been mentioned here and there, peppered throughout some of the books in Fifth Edition and everything, but. Um, but there's not been a lot of focus, and I'm excited to, to see that uh, who they are and and what what kind of things they're going to offer and 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 whatnot. So so who's Global Sandstorm? First of all, they're 
their uh, their prime their primary business is is in the Middle East, right? That's their major presence. Yeah, they're pretty much um, like a a an energy uh, uh, infrastructure company that's based in the Middle East. Um, they were officially formed as a triple as a double A in 64 uh a merger of global oil who global oil has been mucking about in the shadowrun world for a very long time uh and the sandstorm engineering conglomerate um they they have a ton of assets uh, even ones that you wouldn't think of like you cast steel um but they remain kind of below the radar um so yeah they they basically control the middle east except for Sodder Croup, who is basically those two companies in the Middle East just basically butt heads all the time. And yeah. they're, uh, they're based out of the United Arab Emirates, right? Uh, they are based out of... Yes. If you say so. Yes, yes. they are. They <laughs> <Okay>. are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have that somewhere in my notes. But... <laughs> yeah, I'm they're... pretty sure they were, they were on the Arabian Peninsula, and I'm thinking they're from the United Arab Emirates, which makes sense because they are currently... A pretty big power in the world right now, <laughs> or growing one anyway. Uh, yeah. No, their their headquarters is in Riyadh, which is in the Arabian Caliphate. Yeah. All right. So um, so the uh, the head of Global Sandstorm is, and I apologize for pronunciations, but is a uh, well, you're good. Aziz, you practice these, Opti. Yeah, Aziz Ibn Yusuf Shamar. Yes. He's the head of Global's Sandstorm. Shamar is what we'll call him. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's the head of Global Sandstorm. He's a pretty, he's a he was described in, uh, by one of the Jack Pointers in the in the in the book. Um, uh, was it Market Panic? Not Market Panic. Um, uh, cutting Aces. Cutting Aces. Probably. Yeah, he was described as like as as Darth Vader evil. Um, <laughs> 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 like this guy is uh, quite quite a guy he he basically played the uh the the new is it what's it called the new islamic jihad is that what they're called yeah like you know in the year of the comet like when when ibn isa kind of rose to power he was the kind of religious zealot um that kind of wanted to take over everything he supported ibn isa uh and then as soon as it came out that um ibn isa was actually this master shadim uh Aziz just totally sold him down the river, handed him over to the caliphate, and and ended up out of that like making like huge. Like, he ended up coming like smelling like roses, uh, with right. a whole lot of favors in his pocket, and you know, so like he supported the big bad of the, <laughs> the Muslim world, and then it <laughs> became the hero at the same time. Like he just he just manipulated that situation quite masterfully. Yeah, he was like, oh hey, uh, you're you're not just regular terrorists. Um, you're a really scary people. Uh, let me uh, sell you out over here to the people in charge. And, and Yeah, but at first he was like, oh, yeah, let's do this. You know what I mean? Like He's just, he's right. just pretty cutthroat. Yeah, he's just pretty bad. Which, um, which makes him a pretty good partner for... Uh, for uh, or, or makes him... He reminds me a lot of... Um, not a partner, but it reminds me a lot of Villiers in that way. You know, taking a bad situation and, uh, and, and making a lot out of it. Um, Billier strikes me as at least a little bit likable. Like you could sit down and have a scotch with the guy. Like, but but Shamar, Shamar is just straight just like, up evil. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like evil. No, I mean, like evil is kind of one of those weird concepts. But like, sure, sure. I would just say that he's he's just so mm, I don't know, powerful and manipulative and and Darth Vadery, right? Like, just he's scary. He's scary. <laughs> yeah, that, he's a force of nature. Right. So out of that whole well, thing, even like uh, it's funny compared to Darth Vader is how I was thinking of. He's more lawful evil, right? He's not even doesn't even seem like manipulative. He's just like I control all the pieces on the board. Right. <laughs> and not like yeah, I need that's... to trick you into something like Villers right. would. Like. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. And but in that in that whole deal with the uh, with in the Middle East, there he he sold them the new Islamic Jihad out to the Caliphate. And um, out of that, he got uh, he was kind of given full control of all of Ara Arabian corporate affairs, and that boosted them up quite a bit. So um, that was the Shamar's the Shamar maneuver, we'll call it, you know, <laughs> to give o homage to the Villiers maneuver. Um, 
but uh he uh he's he's isn't he isn't his family somehow like really important in the middle east as well the shamar family uh in some other way yes so um Sh aziz is um the head of the shamar family and he is he himself is the emir of the arabian ha heartland emirate so like the uh, Arabian Caliphate is made up of a bunch of different emirates, right? And so the emirates are all ruled by emirs, right? which should make a lot, a lot more sense now that you hear what that means and you go, oh, like so, uh, like an emirate is like a state and like, you know, an emir is like a governor, right? And so he's essentially like the governor of the, of the emirate that's called the Arabian heartland. So he has a, he has a tremendous amount of power within the caliphate okay. itself, in addition to running like the number one corporation in the Middle East. Yeah, that does clear things up a lot. I have like I have no clue about poli like politics in that part of the world, so all of that confuses me. Um, so if you wanted to like get ahead, basically this whole arc of of Spinrad and Global Sandstorm started way back in um, the seeds were planted in Shadowrun Anarchy. Like there's a, a four part adventure in the back of that. Uh, and basically the runners, so if you're, if you want to play Shadowrun Anarchy and you don't want to be spoiled by this, then shut your ears. Uh, <laughs> but essentially there's a, there's a run, there's a four part run where essentially, um, the, uh, uh, the, the former caliph of the Arabian Caliphate, his name was King Kalim Ibn Saud, uh, Saud, and he died, right? Mysterious circumstances, <laughs> like every death in the, in sure, the Shadowrun sure. world. Um, <laughs> And essentially, like a, a Mr. Johnson or Miss Johnson named Goatfoot, who should be familiar to some um, uh, Jackpoint people, uh, decided that she's going to game the system. So she hires Shadowrunners to um, to go contact these different emirs because she wants to put forth a new caliph, right? Uh, like instead of what, tr what traditionally happened is like the the successor of King Kalim. Would just become the new caliph, and everybody would vote. The emirs would dip, would vote, um, but the emirs all do have to vote. And so, uh, essentially, she put forth—not she put forth, but a new candidate was put forth, and she decided that she's going to manipulate this and put her candidate on the map. Uh, and so, these different shadow runs in in, uh, in shadow run anarchy are you or your runners going to these different uh, emirs or emirates and trying to manipulate. Uh, events to kind of put a more moderate uh, caliph in place, and that introduces us to um, the first. The first run you do there is in um, Qatar, and your your goal is to kidnap the family of Jasim bin Joan Al Thani, and one of the people you kidnap is Gabriel Al Thani, who becomes a major player along the way. So yes, the 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 payoff for that. A group of runs is that um, uh, another guy named Ibrahim Kamel becomes king, uh, becomes the uh, ruler of the Arabian Caliphate, and he basically is a little bit less uh, strict, right? Like he still respects the traditions, sure. but he's a little bit more moderate as far as um, uh, dress and as far as women and as far as magic. So not all the emirates are that way, but at least, you know, from the top, like it's not like. Uh, it's not like a horrible, horrible place to be. Right. So that, right. that sets the stage for everything that happens later. That's why I bring it up. Yeah, no doubt. So um, there, Global Sandstorm is a big deal in the Middle East. They uh, they, they basically, they're, and Seder Krupp, Cassie, I think, mentioned this. Uh, Seder Krupp is their main competitor, right? But Their only competitor, really. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, how do they stack up to Seder Krupp, Cassie? Well, I mean, Cedar Crypt's still number two, so they might be there. Uh, they're definitely as equal and probably strong in the region, but I don't know that they <laughs> obviously don't stack up completely yet. I just mean in the region. Um, I think I think um, I think it's mentioned that Global Sandstorm is out competes them in in the Middle East, right? And and yeah, Lofweir and Lofweir hates it. And that's a big part. I think it's going to be a big part of Spin Red and Global Sandstorm is they're both at odds with. Seder Krupp, right? Like they're yeah. bubble or um, 
Spinrad is in Portugal, so they're another European company on top of being global. And then obviously Global Sandstorm is the big competitor in the Middle East. So I think the two yeah. of them will help balance out Zeta Prep a bit. We'll yeah. see. There's some of the um, some of the more astute Shadowrun folks, the people who like to pay attention to like really thin details, um, have brought up the fact that it, it's virtually impossible for Johnny Spinrad to have acquired all the things that he did in such a short time. Um, but it is possible. And if you connect the dots about how he was... Uh, no, you'll have to pick up Street Lethal for this information, so I'm giving you insider information because mm -hmm. that book... How, when is this? When is the Six World podcast release? What's the release? Tomorrow. Schedule? Oh well, it won't be out by tomorrow. <laughs> but if you, wait, if you wait a couple of X, uh, <laughs> then maybe <laughs> then maybe this will all make a little bit more sense. Right. But essentially, um, Johnny Spinrad has made uh, an awful lot of really bad deals, and I say that on purpose. And he's borrowed an awful lot of money from people who don't typically lend that much money to people. Uh, in order to get the liquidity he needed to buy up all the things that he needed to buy. Uh, he leveraged uh, he leveraged his upcoming merger with Global Sandstorm, uh, and he borrowed a lot of money from Global Sandstorm before the merger. Uh, and essentially, he just got a whole lot of cash and then just went on a spending spree. Um, and he bought, you know, more, most people buy pants or TVs, and he, he bought... <laughs> He bought A-rated and double A-rated corporations. <laughs> yeah. Potatoes, potatoes. Uh, so. Yeah, but but if you if you if you look real close, right? Um, and, and like he, he he borrowed from Global Sandstorm. He borrowed from Villiers. He borrowed from uh, some folks in Cheer Terangira. He borrowed from Aziz. Uh, and if you count up like all those people and decide like why, what's what's the common thread? Like the only thing they all have in common is they absolutely hate low fear. Yeah. And so, and so, you can kind of guess, like what Spinrad Global is going to be about. Like I, they're going to do they're going to do their corporate stuff, right? And they're going to they're going to be Johnny Spinrad, but behind the scenes, if you if you kind of read between the lines, this is going to be the world's global anti solder Croup corporation. I love that the the writing even even my uh pretty thick you know skull was able to pick on, up on some of that just this fact that um global sandstorm and johnny spinrad both seem to have some beef with lofweer I, I was looking forward to that uh rj thomas in the chat room says no way this could go wrong um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's well uh, and i like one of the best things is uh to to this came out, that book came out for so long, but hard targets, right? Spinrad yeah. is a target in hard targets you can go kill. Mm. Like, and it's that contract handlers in St. Louis, and we we know now that Villers and Spinrad were making some sort of deal, which it could have been related to that. Though, at least Styx believes that Lofier is, uh, <laughs> may have been, or it's hinted at that Lofier may have been the one putting this on. But Stick then it says like, "Come on, Lofier can do better." Um, but I do like I, it. Like I don't think so. I think Lofier <laughs> is one of those people where he will seed a bunch of possibilities everywhere, and then maybe something will stick. Right. But Johnny Spinrad has probably been the target of more assassination attempts than any other six world figure ever, and, and he's survived. Yeah, and many and, of them were like all like really close to being successful. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, some of them... That's, like, one of his claims to fame. Like, you know, I mean, he's almost like... You know, it's almost like a, a legend by now where, like, you can't right. kill Johnny Spinrad. Like, he just... He just is too slippery. Sometimes you... I don't... He, he's, he's frozen. Um, so... He's lost <laughs> oh, but so one of the things I was going to mention that I thought was neat on that contract is if you look in the contracts on our targets, some have expiration dates and the other ones don't. And that one did, and it was, I think, October of '78, hmm. which would have been. Kill him, right? Oh, oh, oh it's it, catching up. Oh. It's catching up. Hey, Opti, are you, are you there? Yeah. Okay. What oh. happened? <laughs> nobody <laughs> knows. Um, nobody knows. But uh, you, oh, well. you have a, you have a, 
a, an annoyed look on your face. That's for sure. Um. <laughs> it was all it was all silent for a while. So I was just <laughs> trying really? to decide if y'all ditched me. Nope. No. Nope. You had a funny look. At, well, you know what? We've been talking around Johnny Spinrad. Let's just jump right into it. Um, the uh, so Spinrad Industries is is what he's had for a long time, and it, that's what merged with Global Sandstorm mm. to make Spinrad Global. Uh, but um, what is what has been J Spinrad Industries mo for? It's been around for a long time, actually, right? Yeah, they've been around for geez. I mean, as long as as long as first edition's been around, at the very least. Was um, he? When was the first time he was he be, was he mentioned in the in the books back then? Yeah, well, kind of. Like he was mentioned in a in like a throwaway paragraph in the back of. Jeez, I don't know. Was it Mercurial or something like that? Yeah. And it was like, and it was like something like Spinrad uh, does this bad thing and is getting punished for it by the you know corporate court or something like that. Um, and so like you know, I, I don't I don't remember. I don't I didn't know the writers back then, so I couldn't tell you exactly what what they had intended. But um, I think it was one of the fourth edition writers that kind of brought Johnny back into um, prominence. With, yeah, I uh, feel like a lot of people think set. that he just came out of nowhere. Um, very no, no, recently. he's been around for a long time, and and the the reason that he went away has everything to do with Lofir, which goes to explaining his absolute hate on for for Sada Krupp. Um, but it's essentially like you know Johnny Spinrad has been around, like he inherited you know a certain amount from from his dad Diego Spinrad, um, but he merged his company SpinCorp with Industries Futures. Uh, and basically started like living the life of Tony Stark, right? Like yeah. Formula One driving mm -hmm. and like doing extreme sports and, you know, spend his 20s like, you know, getting high and doing that kind of stuff. But um, he made this big crash like when he was in his mid 20s um, and then started to realize he was mortal and took his company and decided, you know what? I don't have to be mortal and started make, make you know his company like started being used to like <laughs> right. uh, make make all sort of like designer like uh, body upgrades and uh, basically became the go to for cyber and bio yeah whereas most people would have had their beast. eyes opened and and been like wow i need to slow down he he was like no i'm going to fix right. this problem <laughs> i'm going to fix me <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah in the in the in the 40s like he started like making fashion luxury items you know sports stuff like all like high end like like louis vuitton you know uh, you know and iron man like mixed you know together sure um and basically like he had the run of european elite society um until 2051 which you know which is that that, that early uh first edition stuff but yeah his his company's based in uh lisbon portugal but his dad is Portuguese, but his mom is American. So he he's kind of he's kind of American too, um, which is why he's kind of got that that um, Northern European look into look to him, but also that kind of dashing, you know, Southern European style. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't he literally date a princess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he's he's got he's got so much. There's so much controversy that just follows this guy around. But like. Like none of it sticks. Like it's all controversy, like in a good way to him, at least, mm -hmm. right? In, uh, you but, mean in like a like a all all publicity is good publicity kind of like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and and like on some in some senses, like you know, you get the impression that like in a different world, like he could have been a good dude, but like <laughs> that world never happened. And, right. Like you know, he, <laughs> he's not the worst, but he's just so he's so all about him. Sure. Um, and even when he tries to do something that seems right, like he just can't stop from, from screwing it up, like screwing it up, meaning like he can't stop from benefiting so hard that he hurts everybody around. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it wasn't always like that. Like, so for example, um, like in 2051, uh, Spinrad and a bunch of other corporations won a bid from the French government to do a Monaco reconstruction project. Right. And he yeah. was given a 50 year lease on this, like Monaco, like a big deal. Right. He's like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to crush this. Uh, but Sauter Krupp was not invited to participate. And Lofir took that personally. And this is so, kind of like the 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 genesis of his grudge against Spinrad, right? Right. Yes, exactly. Lofir, right. And so, you know, in 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 the 50s, he kind of like Johnny Spinrad was like riding high. 
Um, and so, like, he put the company on autopilot, you know, blah, blah, blah. He wasn't even really particularly involved in the Monaco project, uh, but he was just kind of trying to get a permanent place on the Grand Tour, which sure. is kind of like that, you know, um, <laughs> that, that yearly thing where, like, other rich people, like, just hang out with each other and, and cause headlines. So that's what he was <laughs> primarily concerned with. Um, but, you know, he started to cut corners, you know, uh, in in the 50s, and he was 50 or still he's 50 years old acting like a frat boy but you can do right. that like if you've replaced your entire body with you know high grade cyberware um <laughs> so anyway yeah he he his company or him it's it's ambiguous started to cut corners and uh their profits started to skyrocket and then uh somehow i say somehow like essentially love fierce spies leaked information to soul media that uh that they were cutting corners and putting people in danger and the media just absolutely crucified spin rat industries. Um, France pursued aggressive investigations. Uh, and in the end, the corporate court made an example out of Johnny spin by stripping them of their, of their double a uh, status. Uh, and they lost their extraterritoriality and were fined 2 billion new yen. Yeah. And, uh, low fear kind of went like, you know, ha 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 ha. Um, and so like he had all the things he'd kind of worked for kind of just got pulled out from under him and, and, he kind of lost pretty big. Yeah. J dropped from a trip double A to a single A, find a bunch of money. Yeah, lost his extraterritoriality, which was like a big deal to him because he likes, you know, being global was was a pretty big deal. Um, he held on to the Monaco contract. Um, that was that was a pretty, you know, big thing for him to do. Um, and then he uh, relocated to Lisbon. Uh, so that he wasn't always at Lisbon, but he, he relocated there. Um, he laid low for about a decade, uh, and then exploded back onto the public scene, uh, in the sixties. Um, he released the spin X, uh, you know, Nova hot high end sports fashion. Yeah. Um, and along with that, like a, a, uh, a sideways military cyber suite, right? So he had the tech warrior and then he also had the, the spin X, you know, for everybody else. Um, he started making public appearances with the grand tour again, um, and then, you know, uh, Princess Caroline of England, this is to get back to what Cassie was saying, uh, in, she was divorced by then and he started kind of dating her, um, 2063, he got, he got injured severely, uh, participating in the snowboarding event at the, uh, annual Alpine games, but that was a hit that somebody put out on him <laughs> and yeah, he got yeah. better. Um, his, you know, his, his snowboard were... exploded underneath him while right. he was in the middle of a jump, right? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then he broke um, like every bone in his body or something. <laughs> yep. And so as a result, uh, and, and this is kind of a, the, the joke uh, among some of the shadow runners in, in 63 was right after that, Johnny started hiring like a bunch of different shadow runners um, to do runs against Sutter Group and Soul Media. And af only afterwards did they find out that their Johnson was, you know, Johnny Spinner had himself. You know, Johnny Spinnerhead has this weird thing where, like, he likes to be the Johnson himself. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, he goes around, like, hanging out with, like, you know, princesses and things like that. But then when it comes time to, like, hire shadow runners, like, he's the guy who puts on, you know, like, uh, the trench coat and, like, <laughs> goes down to the... He's got the, the trench coat bar. and the fedora on. And... Right. And, he, and, and he, he's the one who hires them. And then you find out later, like, holy shit, that was Johnny Spinnerhead. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much... It. He... he uh, his his in in 67 he'd been dating um uh, the princess of england for a while and in 67 uh claudia romanoff who was uh this beautiful elf that was also high society uh she got pregnant and claimed it was johnny spinrad's baby uh dna testing proved her to be right and then the princess you know but Caroline, the kid was not his son right <laughs> well okay so the weird thing was is again dna evidence proved it was his son uh, sure, sure. And Johnny's like, so again, Johnny was like the whole time he's like, guys, honestly, but this time, honestly, <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> really, <laughs> like, really. And, and everybody's like, whatever. And, and basically, like, oh, you know, Johnny, Caroline broke up with him. <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay, so so here's the the weird thing was right. You, you it's you're tempted to feel bad for Johnny. Like what happened is, um, Claudia Romanoff <laughs> essentially stole his DNA, basically. You know, Lofir was paying for a shadow run, hired Romanov, sure. and she stole his DNA and impregnated herself with, with Johnny's DNA, right. which, I mean, that, that sounds sucky, right? And we all feel bad for Johnny now, 
except when you realize that like you know he was scamming Princess Caroline the whole time just to get you know Spinrad Industries into England you know without any competition right right you know so like this is kind of his mo right he is just so manipulative and good like he is the he is the number one face in the sixth world like no one can <laughs> touch him you know and he just he just does what he does without even thinking about it even when it comes to yes i'm i'm actually falling in love with this person but only because it's going to get me into england and i'm going to become <laughs> uber powerful by being the you know uh what do you what do you call it when you're when you're married to the queen there's a word for that a consort <laughs> I don't. It's not. It's not the king. You don't become the king. But you I think they're called. I've been. I've been watching The Crown lately on Netflix. Yeah, so what's that called? What's that I called? think he was just the Duke of something. Whatever. 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 You become the Matt Smith. <laughs> the right? Prince. Whatever. Right. Yeah. You become the Matt Smith. Right. Yeah. You. You become the Prince Consort. Whatever. You're the. Yeah. You're married to. Yeah. So Johnny was basically trying to play a long con, and it backfired through no fault of his own. Like he was rocking it. Right, like he was doing everything right, and then some, and then somebody, you know, a draconic somebody comes along and says, "No, you're not going to do this. I'm not right. going to let you go into England that easy." Crimson uh, dude says, "Prince Regent, continue." Prince, um, Prince Regent, is that what it is? I trust him. He's smart. Go on. Sure. So anyway, after after that, like he doubled down on his uh, business stuff. Uh, he was brought into the Manhattan Development Consortium, uh, picked up five major sports franchises, uh, started aggressively purchasing smaller companies to fill the gaps in his portfolio uh blah 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 yeah up until <laughs> blah up blah until blah, blah, recently, blah blah very recently though like he's made some really huge purchases right and so like one of these was a grudge right soul media was like these are the ones who broke the story about him in 51 right, right? so he he basically re just purchased them and saying like you know what i'm done being your enemy i'm gonna own you uh, <laughs> yeah that's like the ult the ultimate middle finger of the corporate world right right uh, so hostile takeover there. Uh, he purchased he purchased Regency Mega Media, which is another big deal. Um, Ag's Cognito, which which is probably the biggest deal of the of the um, uh, purchases he made. And then Luciata, like those last two are huge corporations, and the first two aren't slouches either. So with those, I mean, and the big question is where did he get all this money? And we talked about that earlier, right? So he right. just basically um, borrowing went on left a and right. Huge borrowing shopping spree and even some of the the deals he made and the um you know the uh the terms of some of the things that he borrowed are pretty horrible so uh, essentially like if anything happens to johnny spinrad um these guys make out like bandits and so expect lots of people to be gunning for johnny spinrad i love the i love the idea what cassie don't you that he um He's just dodging bullets left and right. Well, not even always dodging them, just surviving them. <laughs> well, and that's that's the idea, right? Like, so everybody in the sixth world knows that it's just a matter of time until somebody, you know, is successful in killing him, right? And so, like, all these clawback contracts and all of these, like, you know, uh, reverse insurance policies that they took out on him, you know, when they when they when they uh, when they lent him the money, right? They're gonna just they're gonna just crush it. Right. The problem right. is the problem is everybody has one of those and they're gonna be hung up in court, like if anything ever happens to him. Like, <laughs> like, like nobody nobody would be the clear winner, right? Like like right, they right. all they all have it in their contract, they would, but like, you know, Johnny's Johnny's done a weird a weird thing. So and for now and for now it's worked. Right. What a what a guy. So so now they've combined with Global Sandstorm to make Spin Global. That's what we're talking about. One thing I want to talk about cuz something confused me. We know that um we know that Spin Global is is a AAA now because of this, you know, like like backroom deal that he made with with Villiers to get to to a, to lease JRJ International which which holds the golden ticket which puts them on the corporate court. One, two, three. We talked about this already. Um, so in Cutting Aces, it is mentioned that that uh, that that Villiers has been meeting with Spinrad quote for years now. Yeah. Um, but if if he had been meeting with Spinrad for years now, that would imply that it was before the Boston thing, and also therefore before 
Villiers allegedly knew about what was going on with Keladir and the stuff that would ultimately take down Neonet. So why was Villiers, why were Villiers and Spinrad talking before all of that? That's, I mean, that's a good question. Um, and, and I don't know that there's a, there, I don't know there's a answer for that other than to say that Villiers doesn't ever not have a contingency. Sure. And, so and Spinrad was going to get where he was going to get one way or another. And part of, part of what he borrowed, it's part of that liquidity that he ended up having was, you know, loans from Neonet. Right. So he could have been, he could have been buying up, um, favors, you know, and, 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 you know, if, if, if there was any tension between Villiers and Sadr Krupp, he could have been, you know, saying, hey, listen, support me and I will, you know, I'll pull the trigger on Lofir. Which, again, Sadr Krupp going down is good for everyone else except for Sadr Krupp. Right. So, you know, like it, there's no there's no there's no shortage of people that want him out, uh, Lofir out of the picture. Uh, so Villiers could have just been, you know, hedging his bets and, and playing the long game. And then, think... and then when it turned out that he was going down. He could have went like, you know what, I, you know, I, I I've lent you all this money anyway. Let's uh, <laughs> let's take this a step further. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you like? That old that Greg. old saying: When you owe the bank money, the bank has all the power. When you owe the bank enough money, you have the power again. Right. right. <laughs> I've never heard that. I like that saying. That's uh, that's clever. Um, uh, and and if that's and if that's the case, like right now, Johnny Spinner has all the money, right? Because he because he owes so many people so much money that they all need him to succeed, or they need him to die. But <laughs> either either one of those things is bad. Like now that now that right. it's happened on such a global scale, he's too big to fail. And and right, that's, like that's worst case we, scenario, Johnny Spinrad dies. Worst case scenario, they get hung up in court. But best case scenario. They everyone just gets money from Rich. the deal. Oh yeah, and nobody's oh, yeah. ahead of anybody. Like everybody's just back where they started, minus one spin. Like there, are, there are there are certain companies like Chalmers and Cole, uh, you know, or or, um, or or Global Sandstorm, right? So if Johnny dies, like those people automatically become almost triple A's in their own right. You know what I mean? Like because they they were the ones who were lending so much money. Uh, and their and their contracts are so airtight and so good, uh, especially like Gabrielle Althani, which we should talk about in a second here. Um, but sh her marriage to Johnny, like they have a, an Islamic marriage contract that's binding, you know, and she gets she gets almost complete control if he dies. Right. You know, so like if the corporation doesn't fall apart, like she controls the whole thing, you know, which which that'll be a really weird dynamic, right? Like right, right. for. For somebody who's basically lived under the thumb of a uh, of a caliphate emir for her whole life, all of a sudden to have more power than almost anybody on the planet um, would be a very interesting thing to have happen. So I do want to talk about Gabrielle, as you just mentioned. It's on my list of things to talk about. But Cassie, you um, you are excited. You've said before that you're interested in things happening in the Middle East, right? So so. Um what yeah. what kind of things are you looking forward to with with Spinrad Global? I mostly like the dis the redistribution of power. I think it was a little too concentrated. I think most people did. That's why I've been working on it. But uh, in particular, the Istanbul write up that is in Cutting Aces is fantastic. I think there's going to become a lot more to do with Africa, especially from the Middle East. And Global Global, global Sandstorm, Sandstorm has a presence there as well, right? Yeah, they're pretty big there, and then, you know, with the Azamunda stuff that came out in Dark Terrors, and I think we'll see, and Seder Krupp also has a presence there, so I imagine Africa is going to become a bit of a contested area between Global Sandstorm and it's been Red Industries and then uh, Seder Krupp. Yeah, Did I... you read the, uh, the stuff that was in Book of the Lost? No. Um, there is another corporation... Um, in Africa, that's a big deal. Uh, the the Zulu nation is essentially like Africa's um, elven nation. It's like one of the tiers, except in Africa. Um, so it's like this huge elven population, and they're kind of all snobs. Uh, but they have a corporation called Ozolo Incorporated, and uh, they're like one of the biggest corporations down there too. And so like they're gobbling up stuff, and uh, they're like about as powerful as uh, Telestrian Industries. 
is okay. you know in in the the northwest. So, so more yeah, regional that's, that's, but significant in the region. Yeah. Yes. So that's they're definitely one to watch uh, as well if you're talking about corporations that are um, big deals in the uh, African Peninsula or African. Yeah. Peninsula. I, I hope to see. I, well, I don't hope. I, I'm certain we'll see more stuff start coming out of Africa because it's constantly been like always mentioned in many, many books. And sure. and just so you know, on. that's 100. Um, <laughs> percent It's not only 100 percent like on purpose, but it's almost 100 percent my fault because <laughs> <laughs> because because I made such a stink about it like three years ago. I was just yelling at everybody at Gen Con like, dude. Africa is not just like some weird thought that we had and like, you know, let's let's not make right. like you know, uh, the Middle East like the butt of all of our uh, um, terrorist and racism joke. Let's you know, let's not you know, if it's if it's the awakened world. Right. Like, why is Africa still going to be like, you know, the place where all the trash is? You know, what I mean, like, yeah, why, yeah. why are we, we going to make them second class citizens? And I'm like, I'll be damned if I'm going to work for a company that just makes something, you know, trash just because there's like a bunch of black people there. Like, no, they're going to have like, right. like every bit of like something cool and mysterious going on as every other part of the world, because this is Shadowrun, right? Like they're not going to be necessarily good, right? Like, like they're not going to be like the best people because again, this is Shadowrun, but there's no reason why they have to be like, poor you know backwoods you know forgotten starving. about yeah right they don't need to be shoved to the side just because uh, you know the west has this idea of what africa or the middle east is right let's go through that and make them really cool and powerful and mysterious so I yeah agree. that's 100 percent happening awesome. awesome so what about so gabrielle althani um who is that okay so remember i mentioned um those uh, arabian nights uh and the arabian the days in the you're right, uh, in the back of uh, Shadowrun Anarchy. So the first, the first job you get is to go to Qatar, and you need to convince Jasim bin Jawan Al Thani to vote for uh, Goatfoot's candidate, essentially. Uh, and the way you do this is you ki you you kidnapped uh, his wife Jerry and his daughters Gabrielle and Lola. Well, along the way, right, like you find out that like in particular. Um, Gabrielle like is one of the ones like she just has like attitude right like she is using sarcasm and defiance like when the Shadowrunners kid Shadowrunners kidnap her right so she like talks back and she's got like this attitude and you kind of I mean at least I did I found myself like liking her like she's a really cool character yeah. like she'd be kidnapped and she'd be like giving guff to the Shadowrunners right who who kidnapped her uh, but we find out later uh, I believe in Cutting Aces if I'm not mistaken um, that Johnny Spinrad has actually been dating her uh, and dating not in a traditional sense, but Johnny Spinrad apparently had converted to Islam and had been attending mosques and basically been seen in, in the presence of uh, Qatar's ruling family, like courting Gabriel Althani, which hmm. like the shadow community was just like, no, nope, no, nope, we're calling BS. <laughs> like, <laughs> we've seen this before. We know what this looks like. Right. Um, only with Princess Caroline, he didn't have to try this hard, right? With Princess Caroline, he just kind of had to be himself, uh, you know, and kind of do the jet set, you know, take pictures, paparazzi type thing. This is different, right? Like, he's actually, you know, like not being his flashy self. He's going to the mosques. He's participating in the religious stuff. He converted, you know, and but he ended up getting married to Gabrielle Althani, who I suppose is now Gabrielle Spinrad. Although I don't think I've said that or written that anywhere. I should. Anyway, <laughs> I keep calling her Gabrielle Alfani. Uh, but she, um, she's Gabrielle Spinrad now. And that in allowed him enough, uh, um, I don't know, what's the word? Uh, gave him enough of an in to start, you know, uh, talking with these traditionalists at Global Sandstorm, right? Who otherwise would just go like, you know, like go back to England, you know, Westerner, we don't want you here. Uh, but now that he seems to have converted and married into the family, as it were, um, they started saying, well, you know, if you're going to if you're going to be good for us and you're going to respect our traditions then maybe maybe we can uh, work together. So that's that's essentially what happened. He he ended up getting married to her and that was his in to the caliphate and to Global Sandstorm. Yeah. Well, he did. He did it again. And and now she again, the marriage contract, you know. She owns, she owns all that's Johnny's. If anything happens to him, well, there's gonna just are, like everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of people 
who uh, who got their fingers in his sandwich. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people, by the way. I, I mean, like virtually nobody is happy about this. You know, like nobody believes Johnny. You know, and and the global sandstorm only put up with this because, like, they could like, um, like they could keep up appearances, right? Sure. They could say. Well, you know, he converted and all, you know what I mean? But like Global Sandstorm is not buying it. Like there you know like there's there's no part of them that's like, "Oh, wow, what a what a what a cool cool guy. What a good, you know, Muslim." <laughs> like no there's no no part of them that like thinks that uh, you know, he's he's actually joined them. Um, but at least publicly they can they can say this is why we did it. Sure. So, before they couldn't do that. Like they just couldn't, you know, join forces with a westerner and justify that to um to their people. Yeah. So Spinrad moving and shaking all over the dang place. I, uh, he's, he's quite an interesting character and, um, who knows what's going to happen to him. Cassie, before we go, before we, uh, before we move on to the after party, like we, like we do, um, mm -hmm. if you had to guess what would be, what, what do you think is going to be some sort of arc, some sort of meta plot in the middle East? Uh, I don't think the Middle East will... I mean, I think they'll get mentioned, but I think we'll see the meta plot much more geared toward Africa. You think so? Why do you, you think know? that? Well, because there are these, uh, like the, the profile of Asamundo and just all the little hints that have come out the last few years in the books. I know in Africa in general, but specifically remind me where Asamundo is. Oh, God. Isn't it... Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't meant to be a gotcha or a quiz. I, I, no, I, was, I was just genuinely I, curious. <laughs> I, in my mind's eye, it's always around Ghana, but I don't think that's where it actually is. Do you remember, Opti, where it is? Uh, I do not. Okay, well, forget I asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody so, in the chat will answer it real quick, maybe. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, get on it, chat room. Um, I'm. A, I'm excited to see stuff going on in Africa as well. I think ghouls are interesting as well, so I can get behind your Asamundo idea. Um, Wakanda, Tagashi Jack says in the chat room. Thank you, Tagashi Jack. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah. I also want to know, Opti, um, given all this stuff, and this will be the last thing before we uh, move into the outro and then on to the after party, which uh, I, I'm always love but uh why why aren't we why isn't season nine of shadow and missions just going to africa or the middle east it sounds also, to me like it's on. rife with stuff because you said that as if it was a real thing i want to make sure we understand that wakanda is definitely not where it is that is from black panther and that's oh. also in east africa and i do know as very specifically it's in west africa right, which right, is why right. i mentioned ghana but i don't know if it's that far north <laughs> Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Before we get emails that won't get answered because this is the last show. <laughs> right. Also on the wrong side of the continent. Right. So, Opti, why aren't we going to Africa or the Middle East for uh, for missions? Don't give me a real answer. I know what the real answer is. <laughs> <laughs> the real answer is because they put it up for a vote. But, um... <laughs> right. It's like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Um... I could because nobody wants to go to Azamando. <laughs> uh, sounds like by there the way, could... Azamando is um, right next to Nigeria. Ah, okay. Azamando and Africa seem like it would have been an awesome place to go for a uh, for a sh series of Shadowrun mission seasons. I I, I disagree because I don't think Africa has been fleshed out enough yet. I, what a I feel what like a great excuse to, to flesh more. it out is is what I say, but. But fair enough. Nah, I Japan is like like it's like almost Seattle level, right? Like Japan has had three mega yeah, corps. Neo Tokyo, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Neo Tokyo is a huge place that needs to be fleshed out. I I, I get that. I get that. You're right. You're right. And it's it feels more sh traditional Shadowrun. I I get that. So uh, can I can I say right? And Azamondo would be really hard to pull off. Like there's a lot of things you just couldn't do. You know, in Asamondo, like that's a that's a nice one off or a nice campaign, but like you're just not going to have the the breadth of things that you can do in Seattle or Neo Tokyo or sure. Chicago even. Yeah, there's just not there's not the history, there's not the 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 different corporations that are there. Like it's just it's it wouldn't be you know a traditional Shadowrun setting. 
Right. Yet. Uh, but I will say this. I will say this. I would. I wouldn't count out the possibility of more Asamondo stuff because people like Asamondo. Yeah. I mean, it's there's been there's been threads thrown out there and and little uh, little hooks thrown into the books and everything that that we could see stuff going on there. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, yeah. So let's do. No, nope, oh, I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna stop it before it gets loud because I almost messed it up. All right, and that sound means that it's the end of the show. Um, the end of the podcast, in fact. Like, you know, I think, Cassie, I think I like our idea of coming back when books get released and doing, like, one-off things. So so don't unsubscribe to the, to the RSS, is what I'm saying, because things might get dropped in every once in a while. Just kind of put it back there like the uh like that thing in on the back burner or that that old friend who you don't call very often but they're always there reliable and able to be messaged on facebook when you're bored and drunk um and they won't get mad at you we we won't we won't (laughs) judge um (laughs) the uh but uh we're at the end of the episode and um what uh we i liked that we did spin rat at the end here because it was kind of like an arc that we were doing right first we talked about um villiers and then neonet and now spin rat it was like a natural way and it feels like we're talking about what the future of some meta plot stuff is going to be moving forward with shadowrun so it, it felt good i don't know anything about that of course not. Opti, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. You were, as I say it over and over again, you were the first guest, and now you're the last. So, um, I am the Ouroboros that eats its own tail. <laughs> That's the second time the Ouroboros was uh, mentioned during the episode today. That was uh, uh, weird. Uh, actually, you know, in, in a funny way, you're not actually the first guest. Cassie, who was our actual first guest? Rusty was nice enough to come on and do like a pilot program. Yeah. What? It's never been. What? I've got to work on my Rusty impression. You have such a good Rusty impression, Opti. Um, I, I talked to him so damn much. Um, but uh, the uh, yeah. So anybody in the chat room, mention it now, and um, I'll uh, I'll I'll uh, acknowledge it in the in the after party. But how many people here were there at our? We called it our episode zero our practice episode that never got released on the podcast and that was rusty joined us for that so um that's what i should have done is dug out some of that we had do you remember cassie we'll talk about it in the after party um (laughs) what what was do you remember what the um what the topic was uh of our of my first appearance um anarchy yeah it was just anarchy anarchy Mm. We had our first episode right after Gen Con 2016, which is where the uh, Anarchy stuff got announced and the uh, little, um, like, like before it got released, the the sample little booklet got given out, and we so sure. we thought it was a great time to talk to you about um, Anarchy in general, and we talked a little bit about that. So. Right on. Yeah, we've come a long way since then. And um, thank you guys for uh, for sticking around. Those of you who especially have been around since since that first episode, we've had a lot of fun doing this, and um, and and I'm gonna miss it. But uh, stuff you, you gotta you gotta make room for for other stuff, and especially for family is one of the big reasons. So for me anyway. Um, but uh, we've had a lot of fun, and Cassie. Uh, well, Opti first. Opti, plug stuff. We always let our guests plug things, and of course we're not going to stop doing that now. Tell everybody what you're doing out in the world. I'm doing the Neo Anarchist podcast. You can go to neo-anarchist.com or to any of your podcast subscription or thingies. And uh, also I write Shadowrun books under the nom de plume of O.C. Presley. And also I do Shadowcasters Network stuff. And I'll be hanging out with you guys at Gen Con and Origins. So come do it. Yeah, <laughs> Cassie, this is your this is your uh, your last chance to tell everybody where. What? Uh... All right, <laughs> come visit the Emerald Grid Twitter, Emerald Grid Twitter, as well as the Emerald Grid Twitch channel. We stream Shadowrun and D and D all the time. I also make a lot of random stuff and post that on 
You can over at Twitter, which I'll try to get back to writing runs. And then I've successfully, I think, scheduled a Shadowrun lore panel at 7 o'clock on the 4th of August? <laughs> <laughs> what day Saturday of, the, what, of Gen Con. That's Saturday? Good, okay. Saturday of Gen Con. Because I think when I gave you the notes, I was like, hey, we're doing our thing Friday evening. If you care... I thought you were, so, yeah, so. Good, good. We were trying to do... We're, yeah, we're doing it on Saturday. So All right, we'll cool. do a more panel and answer questions. I guess technically us. you haven't heard back from them yet since you just sent it in, that's but true. it's, it's in the bag. It. It's in the can. Um, yeah. But uh, awesome, yeah. Um, uh, Brian Roma in the chat room asked, what's next for all of us? Uh, if you stick around for a couple minutes in the after party, I was going to talk about more of what's going on after that. But for right now, just um, what's coming up, uh, we've got our um, head cases show that Opti's on with us. We do Shadowrun Chronicles Boston Lockdown on the Twitch channel here. You should tune in for that. It's on. It'll be a week from today on Thursdays. It's every other Thursday. We're gearing up towards the end of that. Um, GM screen stuff is what I do. You should find me at youtube.com slash complex action. I do lots of little videos that explain um, little esoteric rules and hard to find stuff. It's uh, if you haven't been seeing any of those, you should check it out. I've got we're nearing a hundred of those, so um, that's good. And and uh, on Saturday, if you're watching live um, on Saturday, I'm doing a drawing collaboration where I'm actually going to be on the Facebook page, the complex action Facebook page, doing a live stream on there where I'm going to be drawing an episode live um, and talking with a, a patron or two while I do it who are going to help me come up with ideas. And so if you ever want to see how it all comes together, I'm going to be doing it digitally live. So that'll be fun. You should check out the chat. It's basically everybody throwing shade at up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you can take it. <laughs> what I'm saying is... If you want more of this funny action where everybody throws shade at Opti, you should come check out all of our Twitch streams. Yeah, absolutely. We love, we have lots and of fun. So you can join in. Head cases is a good, great place for that because basically that's what we do the whole time is talk about how, throw shade at Opti and talk about how bad he is at, and how he ruins all of our fun. Um. <laughs> By ruins, you mean make the game super awesome. Yeah, exactly. So um thank you guys so much and for uh if you can um well, you know, we have an email address. I'm not it's not like going away. You can email us and maybe I'll email you back. Um it's at six world podcast. It's at the show at sixworldpodcast.com. Yeah. Um, I'll plug the Emerald Grid Twitter again. Really, if you guys do have serious questions yeah. uh, that you would like to continue to be answered, I will definitely reach out and answer. Yeah, those. Cassie <laughs> Cassie loves talking about this stuff. She's the one who who uh, who uh, kept me putting the the crunchy questions in all of our Q&A because <laughs> I suck at those. And uh, Cassie was like, no, 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 I love answering those questions. So um, so you should do that. Uh, our outro music, which you're about to hear, is from Johnny Nuclear and the Meltdowns. Our logo artwork was has been by David McDermott. He's great. You can find him at sixworlddesigns.tumblr.com. From me and from Cassie, and from uh, our guest Opti and from all of our guests that we've ever had. Thank you guys and goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Bye guys. When the days have gone dark and the sky's turning gray, everybody in the world, they're just staying in slaves. The technology's machines, we just feast for the screen. Lost in reality, can't find peace in your dreams. Society sodomized by the lies and the greed. Addicted to the tech. All right, we're back for the after party. Woo! You got a you got a brewski for the after party? I've never not had one. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I just I just wasn't pressing my face to it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so right away the uh, somebody asks, what are you guys doing from here on? Uh, Cassie's always doing you can always doing the the Emerald Grid stuff, right? Oh, yeah, no, Emerald Grid is doing, uh, we've got a lot of runs right now. We just did a recruitment run last week. I will be doing another recruitment run in March. I hope to do another big push, maybe on our Shadow Run again. That oh, was thanks for the cheer, Chummer Jim. Sorry to interrupt, Cassie. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Jim. Anyway, uh, I'm also writing Shadow Run Anarchy Sheet for Goon Stuff for 5th mm -hmm. edition. I've still got, oh, sorry, I'm writing one for 5th edition. I'm writing one for anarchy working on those in between my jobs i'm very excited and about that goon sheet for real yeah no i uh i should probably I should grab a screenshot and share it it's uh it's coming along cool. i've got some work going on 
Uh, let me see if I've got one that I see. I don't know if I have one that's got what it will actually look like. Like I filled it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll grab a quick yeah. screenshot. If you have a screenshot, drop it in the uh, the stream chat. Yeah, I'll do that. But anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm making a bunch of stuff for World 20. And hopefully we'll get back to Shadowrun. I haven't been running lately, but I think that, I think this would be a big motivator. My biggest part, uh, toughest part is always doing like all the prep work and getting ready to actually run it. So I think once I... Uh, D running DD 5e has spoiled me because so much of their stuff is already integrated with Roll20. So once I get Shadowrun integrated with Roll20, my life will be easier. Yeah. And maybe we... I thought about trying to reach out to some of the guys who did the um, the exporters from Chummer to Roll20 character sheet. So if we got that, then you could make your NPCs in like Hero Lab and export it straight into the character sheet. And yeah, that that would, be... that would be really cool. That would yeah. be really cool. I'm um so I do so I know I we one of the reasons that we had to we've we've talked about it before, so I'm not gonna rehash a lot of it, but a, the short version is. One of the reasons we had to, one of the big reasons we had to end the podcast is that time, I spent a lot of time outside of the podcast preparing and reading and studying. And I know I play dumb a lot, but a lot of that is just to generate conversation. And I am a little dumb, but uh, the uh, I do a lot of research so that I can direct the conversation or whatever, you know, but it takes a lot of work outside of, you know, just when we're streaming. And I don't have anywhere near as much time to, um, to to plan and organize and do all this stuff uh so so i had to pull back from that but there are some balls up in the air i'm i've i've started telling people hey i uh i i don't have as much as long as i'm involved with something that i this is what i'm telling people as long as i'm involved with something that um i don't have to do a lot of extracurricular planning for i have some free time um so so there is something that i that it, it, a big thing that I'm really excited about that I don't want to until I'm 100% sure I don't want to spill the beans on it, but um, it's something that I, I might be able to be a part of that I don't have to do a lot of prep work at all for, um, <laughs> but I can. But it's a I can do it's a it's podcast wise. Um, it's not live like this. One of the tough things about this show is because we record it live and we do all of that. Um, and because just the, the nature of it, I, it takes a lot of prep work um, outside of this. So, uh, yeah. But I'm also do anyway. The point of that whole thing was that I'm I'm still doing a lot of stuff on the stream evenings, uh, shows, um, head cases, complex action, the YouTube channel that I'm doing with GM Screen. I want to I want to crank that up in in a decent way. I've talked for a long, long time about doing 101 series on there and um, sort of like a Shadowrun University almost where you do like a series of 10 or 12 or where I do a series of 10 or 12 episodes in like GM screen style that that are about like Combat 101 or Magic 101. You know, the idea being you sit down, you watch all of these episodes and by the end of it, you're like certified to be on a team start. <laughs> maybe that maybe that could be, a, you know, at the end of it, you can print out a certificate um <laughs> it says i uh i have my degree in combat 101 or or certificate of combat in right, like i know i know how to deck because i went through bobby's class yeah i make no promises <laughs> in making you an expert but the idea is that by the time you watch all those you would know the basics and you'd be able to perform the functions of a decker or a mage or some you know a magical character so i, I really want to spend some time with that and, and make it high quality and and some of the free time that I have now will allow me to do that. Like I want to, I really want them to be animated. So I have to learn animation um, to do it. So um, it's no small feat like there. Like more animated than your your stick figure animations. Well, I don't, I don't actually animate the stick figure ones. So it, it, it maybe it it appears that way in your head, and that means I'm doing a good job. But uh, um, there. I guess you just draw on top of each other i guess you yeah. just draw things right yeah it's just being drawn but uh the idea yeah in my head I, when i think about it i think about it being animated so i guess good job Bobby. yeah thanks i want to do actually there's a lot of things that i there's a lot of storytelling like a lot of ways i would like to illustrate things on gm screen that is hard to do if you're not animating 
and um, and so that's it's it's a go been a goal of mine for a while. I also want to do some tutorials, uh, like some tutorials type stuff and and stuff on. So so stay tuned to the YouTube channel. There's going to be a lot of stuff there, but um, yeah. I had a question that I wrote down. Sorry, I had to take a drink. I had a question I wanted to ask related to what we were just talking about. Um, what? Oh, it was, it was, uh, I, I have always got the feeling, and maybe it's just because I talked to you a lot, Opti, but I always got the feeling that you were one of the driving forces in bringing back Spinrad. Is that true? Or not bringing him uh, back, but bringing him to the, to, to more, the forefront. Um, only because I made such a big push for global sandstorm and the Middle East and Africa. And yes, why do we need Johnny for that? Out of curiosity. Well, that's I guess that's I guess that's how the sausage is made, and I can't I can't talk about that. But Fair enough. <laughs> I guess I guess my I, I can I can probably say it. my big push was to have global global sandstorm as the next triple a and and stuff happened i guess would be the best way to put that and so um i ran with that the best i could is that too much did i say too much no uh, i think that's a good way to us. dance around the <laughs> um but <laughs> but as it turns out like i really liked it anyway you know what i mean like Spinrad is a engaging character yeah um and and so and so having said all that you know, like I wrote that chapter about uh, Spinrad and Global Sandstorm and Cutting Aces, you know what I mean? So I had free reign to basically do and create those double A's and, and kind of give them the, the, the market panic treatment, you know what I mean? Like the kind of write-up that they have in Cutting Aces. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I find those kind of write-ups on corporations extraordinarily helpful, you know, where you can just look at them and at a glance, like know what they're about. You know what I mean? And like have all these like other companies like underneath them and like know the history of the company. Like that kind of stuff just like cranks my chain. And so, um, you know, being able to do that and create the history of for both of those corporations and uh, and the history of Johnny Spinner at himself. Like that was fun. I really, really enjoyed doing that. And now, like I kind of like. I kind of like a little bit territorial about Johnny Spinrad. <laughs> so like, I don't like it now when other characters talk about him or when other, when other writers use him. Like, I'm like, talk to me about Johnny Spinrad. You know, like, don't use him without my permission. Yeah. I mean, I really don't have any, I don't really don't have any power to say that, but like, back off I, RJ. Right. It's like, damn it, RJ. Don't, don't do anything in the Middle East without my permission. <laughs> you know, uh, so, I mean, like, I, we, I laugh and say that, but, like, that's that's more or less true. Like, I do act like that. Right. Like, just, just, <laughs> like, just try to be nicer about it so nobody does it out of spite. Um, but, yeah, like, anytime somebody, like, has any kind of spin red thing, like, you know, like, Brooke, you know, I mean, she was saying, like, she wrote the Dark Terrors thing where, where spin red eventually kind of, um, you know, ascended. And so she, she, uh, she doesn't have to. She, she really the freelancers do not answer to me. They don't have to talk to me at all. Yeah, sure. Um, they can do whatever they want to. But Brooke was really good about like going, Hey, Opti, like, you know, is this, is this how this is going? Is this how you see this going? And, you know, so, uh, Brooke and well, I, you guys really all want to be together. on the same page about what w the story you're trying to tell together. Yeah, so. I think, yeah, I think we do. I think we do. Uh, sometimes it doesn't happen because I mean, there's just different freelancers have different ways of communication and we're sure. just, we not always on the same page. Um, and, and ultimately, only what makes the book is what matters. You know, so if somebody writes something that didn't mesh with my vision, like, you know, it's like when you write it, when you read a comic book, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the different authors are using these characters that don't belong to them. You know what I mean? So, like, you really right. can't stake a claim to them. And if somebody else gets something written down in a book, you don't get a choice. You have to, you have to run with that because they're not your characters. And, you know, now it's published. Right. So... Uh, so that's, that's kind of how it's happened. Now, thankfully, like nobody's taken that and, and we're all pretty good with, you know, if we have different arcs that we want to see happen, we're, we're usually pretty good about that. So, um, so hopefully I get what I want, uh, in, in regards to Johnny Spinrad. And if I do, like, I'll be happy as a, as a pig and soy crap, but, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever feel like you're just writing fan fiction? That's essentially all I do. Right. And then yeah. it gets published and it's not fan fiction <laughs> anymore. <laughs> well, you're still a fan, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what I mean. Like, I'm writing this stuff for me. Like, I really yeah. don't give 
so much care what everybody else thinks. Like I'm writing this stuff so that, you know, I get what I want. That happen. Right. Meme 1029. Just uh, subscribe. Thanks, man. I was, I was like, what is that noise, Bobby? Can't you, like, can you, can you not be so irritating yeah. and play music when people are talking? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm just trying to send you the signal to shut up. <laughs> right, right here comes the big like. Yeah, it's you it's know, even uh, though it's Shepherd the after party. Pull me off stage. Yeah, even though it's the after party. That's my. I'm trying to like transition to a new topic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but yeah, that's that's cool. It's um, I I wish I could write well. Uh, I feel like <laughs> that would be a fun thing to do. <laughs> the complex action screens are quite useful. We all have our own thing. Yeah, but here's the secret. It's not so secret College that I don't school, write them. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just write a lot. But I know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not fiction. You know what I mean? That's a different yeah. thing. And like for, for my job, I'm writing a lot and I'm speaking a lot. You know what I mean? So like I don't, like I had, I had an idea that like I'm a good storyteller and I can I can get you know uh, I can get passion through it. I can I can communicate emotions and communicate stories, and so I had an idea that I could do this, but really every single time you know once once you start writing, you always look at that and you I, for me I'm never like super pleased with it like I'm never like man I'm just great, but then sure. like somebody challenges you like okay here's what I need write this and you go I'll do it. And then, like, you just go, what did I do? Like, I, I can't write that. Like, <laughs> right. you know, and then and then you you find it. You just find a way to do it, you know. Right. And and then I, I look back now, like, on the, like, there's, it's a difference. Like, writing, writing crunch is one thing, right? And then writing fluff is one thing, too. And then writing actual, like, narrative fiction is actually a third thing. And that's the hardest thing. Like, writing yeah. narrative fiction is just difficult and so every time i've had the opportunity to you know get a story in an anthology or to write a novella like i've always jumped at it even though i don't think i can do it i jump at it and i put my effort into it and i find uh, looking back on it i was like wow i did that like i'm i'm stupidly proud of that and i don't even know where it came from what makes it hard is it the storytelling aspect of it um that's what would be hard to me i think for me for me it's the technical part yeah um you know what I mean? Like I get, I get hung up on, uh, on grammar and pacing. And like, if you've been writing for a long time, there's just things that you, you just know to do and sure. know not to do. Um, and I don't know those things because that's not the kind of writer I will. I'm a storyteller, but my, my medium has traditionally been the, the, the narrative event, like, you know, a, a, a speech or something like that. Uh, sure. And so I, I communicate better and I'm, and I, and I, I can see in real time if I'm connecting with the audience or not. And I do not get any feedback when I'm writing. Mm, yeah. And that makes it crazy making for me because like I'm writing the story that I want to know, or I want to hear, but I don't know if it's good or not. You know what I mean? Like I have no way of knowing that. Do you end until... up when you write something, do you end up sharing it with a ton of people because you want to get feedback? Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Like I am, I am so insecure about my, about my narrative fiction sure. um, that I, I workshop it myself. I send it to first my wife who reads every single thing that I've ever written. Awesome. Uh, and she tells me, she tells me from like a non, a non, you know, nerdy, a non, uh, a non invested person, like this, what this sounds like on the, on the face of it. Right. And then I will send it to a bunch of my fiction type friends and then I'll send it to a bunch of my shadow run fiction friends and then I'll just keep sending it back and back and back and back and back and they'll tell me and then that way I'm becoming a better writer because some of the things that like they keep saying over and over again I start to fix right you know in in successive passes but yeah it, it you know like because you because you can write something you oh I'm going to send it to this person I know they're going to tell me this so let right. me go ahead and yeah, fix yeah. that like yeah. one of the big things is like I'm, I'm this huge because again like you can get away with things in a, in a speech that you can't get away with narratively or on the page. And like, that's what I do. I do these huge exposition pieces where I tell people what happened. Right. But in, in, um, in, in the written word, you show people, right. You describe uh, yeah. the event happening or you describe, you know, something where you can infer that these things are true. And that, that, is a hard thing for me to climb. Like it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that sometimes. Like, you know, I want to say, so 
you know, Kitty Pride, you know, you know, phase through the floor, you know, but, but, but that's not, instead, I want to say something like, you know, um, you know, intangibility, you know, crept up her foot, you know, as the wood, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, right? So it's just a weird thing. I don't know how to say it. You want to show them and not tell them. And that's like the biggest thing I get every single time, which on the podcast, as you, as you know, like it's all about right. just telling people. Sure. I don't have to describe yeah. it. I just say this happened, you know, and I describe some of the things that, how that, how that's relevant and then move on. But you just, you can't do that when you're trying to tell a story. J-Rex. Yeah. J-Rex in the chat room says, look up an author by the name of Robert Turk. He says he's chatted with him and, uh, about the differences between storytelling and writing. So, yeah. I might do that. But having said that, I'm getting right. She did really phase through the floor. Um, like in, in, in many of the early issues, like that's like her defense mechanism. And she gets in trouble and just phases through the floor into the basement. Right. That happened at least twice in the early episodes, early issues. The uh, Cassie, now that the podcast is over, what was your favorite episode that we did? Oh man, that, you couldn't have told me that beforehand, so I could have prepped I just something thought and of it. Ready. I thought it would be a better question than to ask you what was your favorite guest we had. God. All the Opti episodes were, were so good. Yeah, the Opti <laughs> episodes were good. Um, talking to Jason was fun because we got to learn I liked about that like, a lot. at the time all the new things that were coming. They've kind of been elaborated on more. <laughs> It's cheating. Uh, he, he gets to like. He yeah, yeah, he's cheating because he's he's the one who <laughs> doesn't have to be like, can I trouble. say this? No, he can say it. Uh, that's fair. I know he yeah, he so dropped a lot of like, stuff. you know, bombs on it. He was like, we yeah. got to break stories on stuff. I mean, I hey, Eric, up. good to see you. I gotta, I gotta say, Kevin, right? Just because he's our most frequent guest. So, <laughs> Kevin, we should give a special shout out to Kevin. Kevin yeah. has not only been an awesome guest over the almost two years that we did this but um but he's saved us a couple of times yeah, Kevin was the awesome last minute we guess we'd call yeah. when we couldn't get our other guests well because because he's so good we're like shit it just released we got to do an episode in two weeks <laughs> yeah he was but he because he was so good i mean we would be like oh we don't know all of the either we don't know what we're gonna do or someone just canceled or or all of the people we wanted to get fell through who can we get? And we could always not just rely on Kevin to help us out, but be really good and engaging and entertaining. So, <laughs> all right, That's, this is a little unfair. Todd does point out that Todd guy, but I can't. <laughs> Todd, were you here Todd. at the beginning of the episode? We just, I I paid <laughs> tribute to you big time. <laughs> yeah, you should have something. I can't answer Todd because one of the fun parts about me talking with Todd is because we're usually talking about the adventures I've taken him on. Yeah. So that's just me <laughs> getting to talk about the stuff I do. <laughs> like it's a, it's yeah, a little... the cold <laughs> open, if you weren't here, the cold open at the beginning of the show was uh, like five uh, audio clips of when Todd played Anarchy with us. Before, that was the first time I met yeah. Todd. I had some old... Of yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, you'll have to go listen to it, Todd. He said he wasn't here, but uh, that was the cold open was a bunch of stuff you said. <laughs> yeah, that he has been nice enough to let me drag his character through, <laughs> literally through under the ocean into space and through the mud. And, uh, yeah, Ke uh, the so Kevin episode, Kevin episodes are always good. Uh, the Jason Hardy was a special one because I liked that one a lot because because I was nervous. I'd never talked to him before, really. Um, and uh, I was really nervous about that one. So, um, but uh, can, yeah. I, can I tell you I, something I, about tell you something about Jason? What was that? Is that he is equal parts like the nicest, most considerate, well mannered, and put together not put together like necessarily like physically like he isn't like dressed like you know in a tux or anything, but like he just he's so articulate and so smart and so thoughtful. But at the same time, like so intimidating to talk to, like <laughs> he does, he like I just get like the impression that like I'm always bothering him all the time, I'm, <laughs> even though even though like he's a really cool guy, you know what I mean? Like he's never ever said anything like that. But like I'm always like in his in his presence, I'm always like, 
you know what? I should go find somebody else to hang out with because I think I'm bothering Jason. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just ran into him at Gen Con and he sat down. It was clearly at the end of a long day. And I'm just like, hey, will you be my podcast? And he gave me his car. He's like, sure. And I was like, well, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. Cassie's, Cassie's the one who always gets us, books us the, the big yeah, main oh. guest. <laughs> didn't talk about adam adam was a good episode adam, <laughs> adam Coble. i was gonna bring up adam, yeah. adam. i was gonna say yeah. my most my most nerve-wracking episode was adam Coble. the story behind getting adam Coble is i at one point i told cassie behind the scenes earlier on no it wasn't even early it was about well it was like a couple of weeks <laughs> it was like a month before we had him on the show i was like you know let's let's workshop some people we're gonna have on the show and some goals that we want to have I, I i think i was like i think i want to have adam coble on the show at some point like let's work up to that no, being no, no, a no. goal no, yeah he was saying it as like first we're gonna try to book this person and then we're gonna try to book this person and then maybe we can get adam as if there was a stepping stone of guests we had to get to right, right. and i'm like i'm just gonna email adam but the funny thing is you didn't tell me that you were like yeah that's a good idea you're, I just you're like, out an yeah, that's Adam, good. And I'm like, hey, I got Adam to come on the show. He was nice <laughs> enough to say, yeah. yeah, I'll come on. Cassie was like, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, that's a good plan to have him. And then like the next day, hey, Adam said he'd come on the show. And I was like freaking out. I was like, no. <laughs> uh, so what, what did you what did you interview him about? Like, what was the. We talked to him about first edition Shadowrun and in particular his show uh, that he did um, on Twitch, Mirror Shades, which was a uh, which was a uh, uh, Twitch campaign he did um in first edition so oh gotcha yeah yeah so that was fun and then i and rj was a lot of fun rj had a lot of energy when we did uh brought him on the set i, I could we just go we're just going through the list of everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, well really all of our guests i mean it's a cheap thing to say right all of our guests are amazing we love all of you um <laughs> but uh but uh we do um, yeah, as Rusty was always a good sport whenever we had viewers who wanted something or requested a topic. He was nice enough to come on, mostly talk about elf stuff. Every um, It always seems like we've wanted Rusty on a lot more than he's been on. And um, every time we seem to want him on, he's got like some crazy stuff going on in real life uh, and that, that keeps him from coming on. But um, And he's always so apologetic about it, too, because because the thing about Rusty is around when we started the podcast, Rusty's big thing to us and and all of us like shattering creators was like hey yeah i'm always like anytime anytime i'm always free i'll come on and talk about shattering with you guys and um and then when we started asking him to come on he like suddenly he's got a bunch of crap going on um, i don't mean that to diminish <laughs> like it's you know he's really got stuff busy stuff going on but uh um, Sorry, guys, I'm playing Lords of Waterdeep with Opti. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> One time I did manage to get him to come on and play uh, and play Overwatch with me on a, on a stream. <laughs> so there is that. Sorry, guys, I'm busy moderating the uh, Shadowrunners Union Facebook page. Yeah, this is not Six World Podcast related, but I've been meaning to tell you, Opti, that um, whatever you guys had, like... Uh, speaking of the Shadowrunners Union, whatever like uh, moderator meeting that you guys had and said, you know, it's time to, you know, we're just not going to put up with this shit anymore. Um, it's been amazing. I have, I sit in the <laughs> sidelines and watch that stuff happening all the time. And you guys are just like Thor shotting people left and right. And just like, <laughs> you're out of here. Nope, nope, you're you dead, know, gone. It, <laughs> it, seems, it <laughs> seems like that, right? But like... We we went through we go through I guess periods of time when like people will post really hateful stuff and then we'll just go like nope we're done with this and then we'll start banning people and then people will just come out of the woodwork like oh yeah well I want to get banned too <laughs> like, <laughs> right. here, here's some more hateful spewage you know and we're like ban 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 like you know and like but it hasn't like like that. It seems that because it's happening so often and you don't see it happen in other groups, I, I imagine this often, it seems like we're doing it a lot. But like, dude, there's like over 7,000 people on the union. Sure. And like, we're not losing anybody. You know what I mean? Like people are replacing all those people we're banning daily. You know what I mean? And like, it's just not, it's a drop in the bucket. Right. And those drop in the bucket people are like hateful Nazi crap posters right. you know what i mean which like right, get right. out of town like what do, i don't need you i don't want you here like get get, get lost and then the, the people that are like well, this is you're being oppressive you know and it's like god oh my god you know what i mean like like what, what did somebody say like this is so dystopian in here like and i really i went we went we do our best to like 
you know, uh, not just be raging a holes, right? And so when people talk to us like on on personal message, we we engage them, right? Like yeah. you're being dystopian in here, and it's like, bro, like if if you know, getting kicked from a Facebook group because like you were using like offensive racial slurs is like your idea of a dystopia. Then like I think you've got your priorities wrong, right? right? You know what I mean? Like, go, <laughs> go, go, go live your life. You know what I mean? Like what? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, you know, this is a voluntary Facebook group that you chose to be a part of. You saw the rules ahead of time and you asked to be involved. You know what I mean? Like, don't don't get crazy when we say, no, you can't say the N-word. You can't make fun of gay people. Like, sorry, chummer. Like, take off. Like, you know, we, you know we, need... you we don't need you here. <laughs> you know like... what we need to do is we need to start like a, a monthly or, or every other week's uh, hour-long stream on the on the Twitch channel where, where Opti just rants about the crap he has to put up with on the Shadowrunners <laughs> Union. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a good point. Eric DeMate says, if I considered that we might be sparring with russian bots <laughs> i feel like that's like probably like the best answer so far right so it's like evo right just like spamming like you know people who are uh like you know trying to trying to put us in our place you know, like yeah get the, get the shadow runners down like we'll we'll be hateful and we'll say hateful things and then we'll blame them for being just like the corpse like sorry screw you and every time i think you know what have i gone too far have i cut off free speech i remember you know what no Captain Chaos did this stuff all the time because this is his house. This is not, you know, like the oppressive government. I'm not charging anybody taxes, you know. <laughs> I'm yeah, not oppressing yeah. anybody's life. I'm just saying you can't say the N-word in this group. <laughs> if, you, if you don't like that, then you can just go pound sand and you're not welcome here. This yeah. is my house. Yeah. I, 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 thanks, for, thanks for giving me a, ch a chance to talk about that, Bobby. <laughs> I've been wanting to hear you talk about it for a while because I, I, I'm not even joking. I seriously love it whenever, whenever you guys have your, uh, your posts that you make on there, um, ranting about like, guys, seriously, what is going on? <laughs> we, have, we have somebody, uh, uh, Norseman Frank brought up, like he said, there's a, uh, People went and created a, a group just to complain about the Shadowrunners Union, and that's not that's not only true, but there's actually two groups now that exist <laughs> just just to be not the Shadowrunners Union, right? Which is fine. I mean, like if you if you and your 140 you know people want to like you know Ooh. be like, hey, that that Shots seven thousand plus group you know is, is the bad one. Are they called right like the Shadowrun Separationists or something? Like, no, they have some anti-union name. <laughs> no, the the yes, the anti-union one, like the real anti-union one. Oh, there is, is an anti-union. Yeah, okay. it's called the Shadowrunners Union for Adults, right? Like, oh, presumably, uh, for adults means that like we can be as racist and sexist as we want to, yeah. and and nobody's gonna you know be the adult in the room because we're all theoretically adults. Um, although that's, I don't know about you, but that sounds like the most childish thing to possibly well, that's say. That's what I was about to say. The <laughs> adults as like adults, what children think it means to be an adult. <laughs> right. Um, Norseman Frank says the, they, they just recently changed their name to something else because again, saying you're an adult automatically means that you're failing. Uh, but, but then there's another one. There's another group that formed basically just to talk about how... <laughs> Uh, how the moderators of the Shadowrunners Union were doing as moderators, you know, so like basically like, hey, were you banned or do you think that they they're they're doing a sucky job? Come talk about it. Like, and I actually, I actually thought, um, I know the guy who who started that one and he asked permission, like, hey, is this cool? I'm like, yeah, it's cool, man. Like, I'll even be on the group. <laughs> so right. like, I I went down there and people were like, you know, blah 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 blah. Me and Rusty were like, sure, we'll take the bite. You know, like so. Like, I don't like when they did this. And it's like, oh, well, um, you know, you didn't you didn't see when they said this. No. OK. And then then conversation was done. Right. Like, and then the next <laughs> person, like they, sh they shouldn't have said this. And it's like, oh, well, where would you have drawn the line? Well, unless it's really offensive. It's like, oh, you mean like this comment? Oh, yeah. Just like that. Well, that's where we draw the line, too. And they're like, oh, you know, so basically it was just like, <laughs> like, like, like page after page of us going like this is what actually happened. And everybody going like, oh, I, yeah, I guess that's right. This you know reminds I mean? like, me of um, when like Dogma came out and there were protesters out there protesting it, and Kevin Smith took a sign and went down right. there. And... That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's awful. No one should watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he got interviewed by the news. Like. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that's that's just. I mean, uh, you know. But uh, so here, for every person that we ban, 
right? Like, and we only ban people when they like straight up are like, <laughs> like, like hateful, hateful people on purpose, right? Um, or like they, we say, please don't do that. And they go, what do you mean? Like this? And we go, dude, don't do that. And they go, what do you mean? Do this? And like, they do it over and over and over again. We're like, okay, we're, not, we're done with this. We're not five years old. Uh, but like, they're not five they're, years old, Opti. They're being adults. <laughs> they're, they're, they're Shadowrun after dark now. Apparently. Um, and so one of the things though, like for every person that we've banned, like I'm getting like three or four or five messages, like, and, and the other moderators are as well. Uh, of of people saying like, hey, thank you for making this a safe place and and a hobby that we can all be a part of and all be proud to mm -hmm. be a part of. Yeah. Like I've never been a part of anything like this union, you know. And this makes me want to play Shadowrun, right? Like, because all these trans people are coming to the union saying like, this is a game that accepts us. Like, wow, we don't get that anywhere else. And I'm like, hey, great. Like, I'm I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah, that's like, really you know, awesome. Like, we're gonna make this a place where everybody's welcome. So all the gay kids and and all the trans folk and you know, all the, um, the racial minorities and all the, uh, you know, no matter what your, your religious preference is. And you know, we're just going to make this a place where we are going to get along. Period. I really, I love that idea, especially with so much talk in the past few years about how gaming as a hobby has become such a hostile place. And like, it, it's really great to try to make somewhere where that's not happening, you know? So... Yep. And, and that's, that's, you know, as far as I know, the folks at Catalyst feel the same way, you right. know, um, uh, I've heard Randall talk about it. I know where Jason stands, you know what I mean? And, um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like we're standing in that tradition as well, not just as writers, but as, you know, moderators of that community. Um, you know, and, and, and the worst, the worst thing is, is people just, you know, and I'm I'm a real life anarchist. You know what I mean? Like you know where I stand. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Shadowrun Shadowrun definitely you know rings a, a bell with me, but at the same time, you know writing about like violently killing somebody for money is just a game. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. bringing that into real life like does not like you know what I mean? Like I don't play Shadowrun because I want to be a shadow runner. You know what I mean? Like I play Shadowrunner. <laughs> I play Shadowrun because it's got themes. You know, and it's got critique. Of, of modern culture, but not because I want to shoot somebody in the face right. or make fun of somebody by using a racial slur and like, you know, thinly veil that, you know, by saying, oh no, I was making fun of orcs instead. Like, that's not why I play Shadowrun. And so, Which is funny, but I've definitely met those people. Like, it's right. definitely ruined my experience a little bit, like in a public game of Shadowrun. I'm right. Like, no, this isn't your excuse to be racist. Like, right. And so like, and, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Like, like if you can't differentiate between what is okay in a game and what is okay in real life, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's others, there's other people who play with the exact opposite. Uh, uh, and, and, and I guess this is fine. You know what I mean? Like every, it takes all kinds, but like people play for the exact opposite reason that I do. Right. Like they're like hardcore, you know, like, like nationalists, hardcore capitalists, and like all they really want to do, like in real life is shoot people. And I guess Shadowrun <laughs> is like the closest thing. Right. And so like they play that, which, which totally blows me away. Cause like, I don't, that's not where I'm at at all. Yeah. And so if you, if you want to do that, like there's a place for you, Shadowrun after dark, apparently go, go have fun. And, you know, <laughs> we, you know, and there's, and there's a certain <clears throat> amount of Shadowrunners folks <clears throat> too. And I, I don't get this. I don't like it, but also I don't, I don't think it's bad, but there's people who just like guns so much in Shadowrun, uh, in the Shadowrun community that they just want to post guns all the time. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't have a, I don't like it. I don't think it's awesome, but at the same time, I don't think it's bad. You know sure, what I mean? Like if you sure. like guns, like go ahead and like guns. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're not, you're not posting about shooting people. You're just posting like how cool this gun is. So fine, right. post about that, which, which, which is, I guess to the point where, I don't like guns, but you are more than welcome to post all your guns. Like, have fun, do your thing. I don't like it, but, you know, we don't have to agree on everything in order to all have fun here, right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, blah, 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 blah. I could talk about this all day. One of the last things I'll say, I guess, to close it out. Um, and Chummer Jim just, uh, before I do, Chummer Jim just uh, dropped a, a thousand bits into the cup there. So, thanks, Chummer. Jim. Thanks, Chummer Jim. Uh, you are a chummer, Jim. Yes, you are. <laughs> Valetta Vadim says, a lot of my trans friends gravitate toward the 
you are what you choose to be theme of where in Shadowrun, and I think that's probably yeah. true for a lot of people. And again, another all the reason, like let's make a let's make a welcoming place for for people like that. Yep. So. Yep. 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 Thank you, Opti, uh, for joining us for the last I... episode here. My pressure. We'll we'll do one off ones here and there, I'm sure, in the future, and and you do write for things, so maybe we'll see you around again. Um, Cassie. Anytime. Let's uh let's do that someday. <laughs> yeah, I'm on board. But yeah. I am ready to get off here. I've got yeah, to catch too. a plane to Panama at six in the morning. So. Yeah, and I'm hungry. Panama. <laughs> That's all right. I've been hearing. Panama. I uh... <laughs> Yeah, I did hear like a couple weeks ago that you were leaving in the morning to go there. So have fun in wow. in doing that. I'm gonna go as well. Um grab something to eat before I go to bed. And um, guys, we will see you around. Stick around on the Shadowcasters Network here, and um, we'll be here, uh, just doing a different. I'm gonna go write Matrix shows. stuff. Yeah, more Matrix stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So, bye, guys. Peace out. Bye.